calling 2024 the year of chaos. I think 2024 is going to be one of the most chaotic years we've had. Economy, politics, division between yeah. America. It's yeah. going to be chaotic. Unfortunately, we didn't choose our enemies wisely. You screw up, you pay a price. We obviously didn't choose our enemies wisely when 9-11 happened, weapons of mass destruction. We saw what that, the $3 trillion that we paid for, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's choosing the wrong enemy. Now we have Israel, Palestine. They're going through their mess that they're going through. Gaza, Egypt's getting involved. Turkey, the strongest military in the Middle East that has 350,000 active soldiers. They're now getting involved. You got stories that came up today about Wagner Group. Now they're selling missiles to uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah is backed by Iran. Iran gets involved and you piss them off. They're just waiting for war because they can't stand uh, what Israel stands for. Russia's in the mix. You got Azerbaijan took advantage of Armenia. You got the Ukraine-Russia deal. You got China on the other side waiting for Taiwan. You got election going on. You got one candidate they're trying to eliminate. You got one candidate that can't even walk. We have a leader that is not loved in Joe Biden, that is not respected, and that is not feared. When you have a situation where the leader is not loved, feared, or respected, who shows up? Bullies show up. We don't have that in America today. So it's gonna be so chaotic. Audience watching this, they're saying, holy shit. Like, you have to be aware of it. You have to be aware of it. And then from there, you have to do your own research. If there's ever been a year where there's gonna be more casualties in business economically, as well as a lot of casualties could be in war, it's gonna be 2024 because there are many unpredictable things that are moving parts that no one can 100% say, here's what I think is gonna happen. Those who are prepared for it, to the most that they can be, they're gonna win big in 2024 because chaotic years produce a lot of successful people. Chaotic years produce major major leaders. I got a note in the, in the book. Open it up so you can read it. It's the truth. And I said, nor PHP nor my life would be the same without you. I'm going to tell the kids about this man named Matt Sapala. My man. I got a lot of respect for you, Matt. So my guest today here in the Seven Figure Squad Studio Podcast, we've got a person who's absolutely changed my life. I mean, how do you introduce somebody who's absolutely changed your life on so many different levels, not just financial, not just entrepreneurial, but as, as a father, as a husband, as a spiritual example of what can happen in your life if you choose to follow the, the call of God. And uh, I remember when I received the message from Patrick B. David in 2009, he says, I, and by the way, I put it in my book, Faith Made Millionaire. And uh, I didn't re we didn't really respond and really interact until December of 2014. And that's when I officially joined the PHP agency organization. So um, with Patrick Day, what he's done in business, what he's done here in the studio, we're just reflecting on it right now, how yep. many videos were shot in the studio right here at the PHP studios here in Dallas, Texas. And the amount of impact you've done since the, the, the video, Life of an Entrepreneur, exploded. But do you think Patrick slowed down from there? No, he's like, high five, great job, great job. Next, next, next. That's the type of leader, that's the type of influencer we have here. Uh, Wall Street Journal bestselling book of your next five moves and forthcoming here on December 5th, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, PBD. Thanks so much for being My here. My man. My man. <laughs> honored, honored. Uh, I wasn't expecting you today. Uh, it's kind of nice just to be able to zip across the world <laughs> and, you know, and, do, and do your thing. So um, I, I, I want to I dive right in into the financial, your financial services journey. Okay. You know, yeah, I mean, we had a VP call today. It was kind of odd because we're facing, you know, just a new era of PHP. But uh, I want to go back to 2002. I want to go back to 2002, you, you know, just the, and the beginning of how it got started. You know, you, you always talk about what it was like to be at, at uh, 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 Morgan Stanley on 9-10, on, on uh, a day before 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, how was your journey getting involved in the insurance side, I'm excuse me, the investment side and then the insurance side? How did that prepare you? How did that moment being on the investment side of things prepare you for a journey on the insurance side of things? It's funny. Today I was talking about uh, on a podcast in Dallas. I said there's three things that I am, I'm very interested in and I like. One is numbers. One is sales. One is people. I'm, I'm fascinated by those three things, right, how people are in sales. But, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was dating jean -Vier and jean -Vier's working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. This is, you know, 2000, 2001. And then she's always got this nice car. I'm like, how do you have all these nice cars? You know, I'm a broker at Morgan Stanley Dean. Who are your clients? Well, the lot, 
Lots of the Laker players are my clients. I says, wow, that's how you make it. How does the money work? Well, once you have money under management, you make a certain fee every year, this pays you, and if you sell this, this is fascinating. And then I wanted a job, couldn't get a job. I don't have a degree. And then obviously I start off with Morgan Stanley Dean Wooder, uh, day before 9-11. And then from there, you once you go in, and, and you know you're going to sell. Like I sold early on at 11 years old in Germany when I was collecting beer bottles at Erlangen and I bought my first Super Nintendo. That's when I knew I'm never going to starve. At 11 years old, I knew I was never going to starve because I'm going to be able to go out there and if I can give service, clean up, sell, do something for you, I'm going to make money. This is why when Tico reads a Thomas Sowell book, my oldest son, and after he reads this book by Thomas Sowell, on a Saturday and a Sunday, they go into the community, start knocking doors, and it's, I have to make money, I have to make money, I have to make money. And then eventually one lady calls and says, hey, are these your kids? Yes, because they know our phone numbers. So these kids say they want to come help me do something so they can make money. I said, yes. Are you okay if I teach them how to walk my dog? Sure. They walk the dogs, they make the first $20 bill. I told them, for every dollar you guys make, I'm going to match it. So they made 20. I matched 20. That's 40. Tico chose himself as a CEO. He says Dylan was a great partner, so he gave himself 15, <laughs> and he gave Dylan 15, and he gave Senna 10 bucks. Wow. Because Senna was very good, helpful, and all this other stuff. And I said to them when I sat him, I said, guys, this is a very monumental moment for you. You will never start for the rest of your life. You're always going to know how to make money. Money's out there. you got to give the service. You'll get the money back. So for me, once I knew I was going to sell, then it's what am I going to be selling? Am I going to do stocks? I watched the guy in the corner office at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, and he ended up, you know, suicide stories you were hearing about left and right because, you know, clients had money, the market tanks, they mm -hmm. went from making 700 grand a year to 70 grand a year. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be a stockbroker because everyone's calling nonstop. Do I want to be a guy that goes and just does 401ks? Do I want to do auto insurance? Do I want to do this? Mm -hmm. And then I fell in love with life insurance and annuities and mutual funds. And that's kind of how I use my licenses. Wow. And then went to Trans seven and a half years later. You know, went and uh, re watched the movie Jerry Maguire, okay? Literally, I, I watched Jerry Maguire Show me the money! So it re inspired me to write a 16-page, you know, letter with nine things I would do in that company we were a part of that here's what I would do. I sent the email to the top of the company. Nobody reacted. And then I sent the company, I think it was Pat Shepard was his name, the CEO of Aegon. And I want to say that's his name. And then he responded. Then he told all the executives from you know, Transamerica to call me. Then they flew out to Orange County. I was an EMD, so it's probably 07, yeah. 08. We had a five, six hour meeting, seven hour meeting. Yeah. And I said, here's what I'm gonna be doing. Yeah. Then they didn't wanna do any of this stuff. I said, no problem. If you don't think uh, this is gonna happen, then we have to start our own company, October of 09. Yeah. Uh, we started PHP and the rest is history. So I wanna take a, a couple steps back. So you never, I mean, you're in, you were in LA at the time, you're in Glendale. Yeah. And, and, uh, I mean, when I got involved in insurance, I was proposed to sell real estate, I was proposed to sell mortgages. I attempted to do both. I mean, my first uh, binder in uh, taking notes was a loan officer card as well as an insurance mm -hmm. card. Were you never attracted to real estate? Were you never attracted to mortgages? I'll tell you one thing. So I had a client of mine. I go to Valencia to his house. He's 61 years old, Armenian guy. And I go to his house, million and a half dollar home, view the valley, canyon country, all this stuff you're looking at in Valencia all the way down. And, and I'm selling him an insurance policy. But at the same time, I'm kind of wondering if maybe real estate was the way to go, and I made a mistake. I said, how long have you been in real estate? I've been in real estate for 40 years. So that's great. This is a Saturday night we're having dinner. And at 9 o'clock, he says, okay, guys, i got to go to sleep early. I said, why do you have to go to sleep early? Because I'm working tomorrow morning. Why are you working tomorrow morning? I'm showing properties. And I'm like, you're showing homes on a Sunday morning after 40 years? Yes. And more and more people I talk to within the real estate space, Anybody that had been for 30 years, most of them had a divorce two or three. But every decade, you would have a divorce, and you'd have one or two or three bankruptcies. Why? So right now, I consult for a lot of these real estate mortgage companies at Bedevic Consulting. So we see what's going on in different industries, because I, I see what's going on with transportation, yeah. with numbers being down 70%. You know, and real estate wow. uh, loan applications are at a 27-year low, and real estate sale according to Wall Street Journal, is at a 20-year low. So these guys went from making 100 grand a month to 200 grand a month, 50 grand a month, to making three, five, 10, $15,000 a month. How are you surviving? So, and, and how many of these guys, Matt, you know this mm -hmm. in sales, if you make a million a year, 
Okay, so you made a million this year, you made 600 year before, you made 300 year before, you made 100 year before. Sure. When you get to a million, do the people live as if they're making 300 or do they upgrade their life as if they're making a million? 1.2. They upgrade their <laughs> life as, they're, as if they're making 1.2. Right. But then here's what happens next. If you go from 1.2 yeah. to 120 grand a year, oh. what do you do then? Oh. Actually think about it. Yeah. What do you do then? I just received three text messages from somebody selling cars from a Lambo, a G-Wagon, and a Ferrari, all mortgage and real estate people. How do you make it happen? Yeah. So now wives are selling their Chanel purses, they're selling their Louis, they're selling their art that they bought that they knew nothing about, they're selling their exotics because they gotta get rid of it, they're trying to get rid of suits, shoes, sure. they're trying to sell belts on eBay. Uh, so yeah, when I saw that, I'm like, yeah, real estate is not for me. At Bally's, many of us at Bally's, when we were selling memberships, we know we were leaving, mm -hmm. Someone to real estate, someone to loans, someone to solar. I went insurance. The beginning five years, three years, the mortgage real estate guys beat me. But long term, yeah. I mean, at the end, it wasn't even a conversation. So to me, that's one of the reasons why I wasn't going to do real estate and mortgages as a career. Investment, we're in the process of right now buying multiple properties, 20 acres of land, 300,000 square feet, all this stuff. I'm for it for investment. I'm not for it for a career. There's a recent clip from, I think, a couple podcasts ago where you talked about the negative real estate crash. Yep. How oh, thing yep. you compared to Venezuela yep. like this. And a lot of guys in the real estate community say, oh, we got Patrick, Patrick. You know, he's, he's yeah. flipping. He's, he sees it now. Because yeah. uh, you, you have a video from a, a year ago, my message to real estate uh, professionals. And, and so, and, and by the way, this last couple of weeks, within this week, yep. the National Association of Realtors uh, Home Savings of America and, and Keller Williams are found guilty of a class action lawsuit of colluding commissions of, of, of them raising. And next thing you know, as soon as that happened, three other brokerages got another class action lawsuit. Uh, earlier this week, a mortgage companies are asking for their senior loan officers to repay back their bonuses <laughs> because things are, things are tight right now. So there's two camps. You know, we were talking about two different camps of, of real estate professionals yep. we we're talking to. First camp, they're having the years of their, they're having the time in their life. Everything's great. Listings, closings, you know, left over right. The other camp is, I haven't closed anything in a minute. And if I don't do anything right now, it'll be until next year that I'll get paid. H how do we reconcile and, and help? Because I know in financial services, when I came into it, I saw the ups and downs also. That's why I didn't get involved in mortgages because I was very easily attracted to that because I'm in Chicago, hot real estate market. And, and, and so what, what, do we t what message do we do and help right now with Real estate professionals, how do we? Well, first of all, realtors, we they're going to be selective hearing, right? They're, gonna, they get, they, they're right now so desperate. They have to pick and choose whatever story they want. My position doesn't change. By the way, to, to the realtors and mortgage loan officers who saved money, they don't look weak. But I talk to the guys that didn't save money. They're getting destroyed going through divorces right now, okay? They can hype it up all they want. They're getting divorces right now. They're going through tough times. And I feel very bad because yeah. all I'm trying yeah. to do is get these guys to do, a lot of them are going into different things to sell and I'm gonna be a digital market, I'm gonna get my insurance license, but they're going to different kind of markets to go through. So to these realtors that respond to what I have to say with a reverse crash, let's actually say that happens. Let's actually say that happens. Okay, so to those guys, do you really wanna see interest rates decrease where we go from the eight points to seven to six to five to four? Do you know if Powell lowers the rates from eight to four, say in a span of a year, say in a span of 18 months, do you know what that does to values of homes? Skyrockets. By the way, the house I bought, I bought it for $20,400,000. You've seen the house that I picked up. <laughs> when sure. I'm in the, the day I am in contract, the next day I get a $25 million cash offer to buy the contract. I've shown you that email sure. before when they yeah. wanted to buy the contract. Yeah. Our house is roughly 1.1, 1.2 acres. We got 800, 800 feet of water frontage, 165 foot dock to put a yacht there. We got, it's a very nice place that we live in. Messi just moved right in next to us. Matter of fact, we were trick or treating with Messi. Our kids were trick or treating nice. with nice. him and his kids. He was actually dressed Crazy. out there. Very cool. Nice. I didn't think he was going to be doing that. Here's the point. I remember seeing that email. He wanted to rent your house. That's right. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. But I'm glad he bought instead yep. of renting, so he settled. They're, they're actually going there. The kids are going to the school. So anyways, so last week, 10 days ago, when I sold my house, it was record-breaking for that area. Fort Lauderdale just broke a new record 10 days ago. A new house sold by my realtor, okay? 
on the on Wall Street Journal, forty million dollars. <sighs> you know how big of a land it was? 0.4 acres. So it's a lot, lot smaller than yours. Lot smaller. So that puts our property, some say, between forty to forty-five million dollars, and we've only owned the house for for a little over, I don't know, two, two and a half years mm -hmm. is what we've owned the house, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not selling. So it's not like, well, Pat's saying this because he wants to sell. Not at all, okay? Matter of fact, the right thing that probably needs to happen to our house is for it to go from $45 million to $31 million, $29 million, $30 million, somewhere around there. Why? Here's why. If rates come down, property value is not decreasing. Matter of fact, property value is even increased a little bit. Even though there's no inventory, People are not willing to give up their 3% loan that they have for what? To go get another house with the equity they're going to pick up, and a new house they pick up is going to be at 8%? That doesn't make any sense. Why would I sell my house right now? I still have to go buy another house at 8% anyways, right? So to those people who are rooting for rates to come back down to 4 all I would tell you is it's going to hurt many different aspects of the economy if we go there. But let's just say we do go there. Let's play that game. No problem. People haven't yet ran out of savings. They're still sitting on money. The market right now, if they keep printing money, they printed trillions of dollars of money into the economy, right? Mm -hmm. the, the original, I'm talking to Tom Bilyeu yesterday for five hours we did a podcast at his house wow. in LA. And we're talking about a possibility of a reverse market crash is what I was telling him. I started talking about this a couple weeks ago where if they do some of these things, the market just goes bingo, and Dow and S&P, or let's just say Dow goes from 33 or 38 to 45 to 55 to 58, okay, the more they print, the more money guys like me make. Because the more they're printing, money flows to the top. Rich get richer, poor get poor. Yeah. But the disparity of what that's happening is getting bigger and bigger. 2023, I called it the year of investigations and all that stuff that was gonna take place. Who got investigated in 2023? Biden, mm -hmm. Trump, Fauci, uh, FT, uh, SPF, you got the SPF now, $8 billion he stole from people that he's got to go to jail 100 years. He's going to probably end up doing 10 years. Biggest fraud the, on record. Biggest fraud on record yep. ever. And Kramer from MSNBC was calling him. He is the J.P. Morgan Chase of our era. He is God. And he, people gave him billions of dollars without asking for a single board seat. The guy didn't have a yeah. board, a guy in his 20s who got billions of dollars from some <laughs> of the smartest money people in America didn't ask for a single board seat. He told him to go F off. This story's been told, I think, by mm -hmm. Shamat or somebody else. So he gets that. He's going through that. But let me give you 2024, what I predict happening. I'm calling 2024 the year of chaos. 2024, <laughs> I, and I, by the way, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong at the highest level. But I think 2024 is going to be one of the most chaotic years we've had uh, in climate. And I'm not talking climate change. I'm talking climate, like economy, politics, division between yeah. America, foreign, potential foreign policy. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. going to be chaotic, huh. right? How, how strange it's going to be. So uh, why chaotic? Well, a couple different reasons. One, unfortunately, we didn't choose our enemies wisely. And when you don't choose your enemies wisely, you screw up, you pay a price. We obviously didn't choose our enemies wisely when 9-11 happened, weapons of mass destruction. We saw with that the $3 trillion that we paid for, by the way, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. That's choosing the wrong enemy. And now we have Israel, Palestine. They're going through their mess that they're going through. Gaza, Egypt's getting involved. Turkey, the strongest military in the Middle East that has 350,000 active, active soldiers. Turkey, 350,000 active soldiers. They have the most powerful military in the Middle East. They're now getting involved. You got stories that came up today about Wagner Group, the guy that was trying mm -hmm. to you know, Russia. take out yeah. Russia with Putin. Mm -hmm. Now they're selling missiles to uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah's backed by Iran. Iran mm -hmm. gets involved and you piss them off. They're just waiting for a war because they can't stand uh, uh, what Israel stands for. Russia's in the mix. You got Azerbaijan took advantage of Armenia. You got the Ukraine-Russia deal. You got you know, uh, uh, here Israel, Palestine, Hamas killing, and then boom, 8,500, 1,500 people there. You got China on the other side waiting for Taiwan. You got election going on. You got one candidate they're trying to eliminate. You got one candidate that can't even walk. You got a candidate where as a kid growing up, as a kid when you grow up, a kid needs to experience three things. A kid needs love, a kid needs somebody they respect, and a kid needs somebody they fear, okay? A mother cannot impose all, all three. This is why, you know, when you see a kid that's being raised by a single mother, they turn into, 
gangsters, troublemakers, all this stuff, because the kid eventually was like, I remember at 14 years old, my mom was trying to discipline me and she was hitting me. I'm like, and she went, ow. I said, what are you doing? I said, you can't hit me anymore. It hurts you. Stop. Mm. It's the last mm. time my mom ever raised her hands on me mm. at 14 years old because it doesn't do anything to me anymore. So she could no longer tell me, where are you going? What are you yeah. doing? Because yeah. I didn't fear her, yeah. nor did I respect her. I just loved her. Yeah. You can't impose your fear on me. So yeah. where am I going with this? We have a leader that is not loved in Joe Biden, mm -hmm. that is not respected, and that is not feared. When you have a situation where the leader is not loved, feared, or respected, who shows up? Bullies show up. If in a community, okay, in a community, in every family there's that one person that the entire family fears. You don't want to get that call from mm -hmm. that person. To some it's an uncle, to some it's a father, to some it's an aunt, but it's somebody. Yeah. It's a brother, you're like, dude, oh, sh you're going to, like, right now, before even doing this, my, my wife called me. Sure. Why did she call me? Because Tico and Dylan weren't listening to her. Uh -oh. Why are they not listening to her? Because they're two alpha boys. Yeah. And even a mom in her mid-40s cannot, 11, 10 year old, they feel like they can push their weight around until dad gets around. Oh, quickly, he's putting his jujitsu outfit and he's going to go to jujitsu. Why? We don't have that in America today. So Biden's going to be our president all of 2024 if he stays that way. That means the element of no fear, no respect, no love continues. They're afraid of Trump running, and God forbid he runs. Then you got Newsom, DeSantis, all these other guys that are getting involved. You got RFK getting involved. The possibility of another Ross Perot ruining in for a senior and a Clinton win, it's going to be so chaotic. Now, audience watching this, they're saying, holy shit, like, well, now, give me a, <laughs> what is this? Am I supposed to get excited? What, what am I going to be yeah. doing? Okay, you have to be aware of it. This whole idea that I don't want to be aware of it is problematic. You have to be aware of it, and then from there you have to do your own research, yeah. and then you have to come up with your own plan, yeah. and if you come up with your own plan, and you're able to choose your enemies wisely, and you choose to lead, and you choose to anticipate, and you choose to be paranoid, and you choose to not be casual, if there's ever been a year where there's going to be more casualties in business economically, as well as a lot of casualties could be in war, it's going to be 2024, because there are many unpredictable things that are moving parts that no one can 100% say, here's what I think is going to happen. Mm. Those who are prepared for it to the most that they can be, they're going to win big in 2024 because chaotic years produce a lot of successful people. Chaotic years produce major, major leaders. You're a perfect example of it. Let me give you a story. COVID happens. March 14th or whatever it is, I'm in LA, 2020. We take the kiss circle. We're about to have a meeting with Gabriel Brenner, Oscar De La Hoya, our board, Greg Scher, Bob Kurz, and everybody's flying in. Mm -hmm. We're at the Beverly Hills Hilton, okay? And every time we go to LA, we like to take the kids to, uh, to what do you call it, Universal Studios, because we love it. That's the day you're watching TV, and it says NBA shutting down, NHL shutting down, Disney shutting down, Universal Studios shutting down. And you're like, is COVID really that bad? It's that bad. Oh my God, what yeah. are we going to do? So I look, at, I look at Jen, I say, we got to go say goodbye to my mom. We're getting on a plane. We're going back to Dallas. 23 hours we're in L.A. Everybody canceled. Greg canceled. Bob canceled. Oscar. Everybody canceled. We come back to Dallas. I drop those guys off. I come back to the office. I sit here in this office, mm -hmm. in my office on the other side, till yeah. 4 o'clock in the morning I'm researching. Mm -hmm. Pandemics, how to market, how the economy reacted, how to, all this stuff I'm looking at. Nine out of ten pandemics when the market crashed, six months later it recovered. The only one that didn't recover after 12 months was AIDS. All the other ones recovered six months. It was all fear. Fear, yeah. fear, fear. Boom, market crashes six months. Oh, we're okay. We're okay. We're okay. We come back up. But we're doing the first Zoom. Most of the time when we do our calls, our girls are, you know, makeup, looking good, all this <laughs> stuff. They're not even on it. And if they are, they have no makeup on and they're not showing their full face. You remember that I remember Zoom? Yeah, for sure. And during that Zoom, Pre that Zoom, I'm calling everybody to get everyone's temperature, and I'm listening to their voice. You good? Yeah, 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 yeah it's good. Yeah, we're good. We're gonna figure this thing out. Okay, that guy's nervous. Boom. And I, they don't even know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm putting down yeah. negative. I'm putting up positive. I got off the phone with you and Sheena, and I put you positive. I said, Matt, what are you gonna be doing at a time like this if they shut down? I said, Pat, oh, we've been doing Zoom. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. I said, who else is like that? Hard as well. Great. We do a Zoom. You come in. And you start telling, this is how we're selling, this is how we're doing. And I said, Matt, can you train everybody? You did. What happened? During that season, that was a chaotic year, 2020, we had an example of somebody who brought poise to others. We had a CEO at the top that's a wartime leader that we're mm -hmm. going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Collectively, everybody followed the lead. Boom, we had a record-breaking month 
a month, two months later. Remember that? Of course. That's yeah. all where we said we're not going to let the enemy win. No. We chose the right enemy. We didn't sit there and say, oh, my God, what if this thing takes place? So yeah. I think 2024 is a similar type of a climate. I just think it's a bigger opportunity. I think 2024 is going to be a much bigger opportunity than the last chaotic year we had in 2020. I just got jacked up. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. getting bang up phone calls yeah. right now. Um, okay, th this chaos. You know, we've been trained to run towards chaos. A lot of people have been trained to run away from chaos. So what areas of opportunity do you think will rise in 2024? What, what, what markets, what sectors? Uh, if somebody needs to be cross-trained to do something else uh, with technology and AI taken in, is there an opportunity there that you're, that you're excited about? Well, anytime you know, uh, uh, the temperature goes that high, uh, people are afraid. Anytime people are afraid, they're willing to listen more. Anytime people are arrogant and cocky, they're not willing to listen. When you call a mortgage broker who just made $180,000 last month, he's like, yeah, man, I got 10 minutes, what you got? You know the, but when you talk to that same mortgage broker that made $12,000 last month, it's like, hey, yeah, man, I, I'm sorry, am I on time? I just came five minutes on. So, okay, so hey, what do we got? I hear you guys are, hey, how come you're listening now? You weren't listening 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. What happened there? Now you're listening. So the market's gonna have a lot of people that are listening, which means show ratio of people wanting to meet with you is higher. Availability ratio, people saying, yes, I'm willing to meet is higher. Typically, you have to follow up with a person seven times, so you make an appointment with them. You're probably going to have to follow up two or three times. These are all good things for somebody that's in the sales business. You're going to be able to get ahead of it. If you're in the real estate and, and the mortgage business, I'm telling you what I hope happens because it's not good for the climate. I hope rates stay at 7 or 8% for throughout the entire time in 2024. Yeah. Do I think that's going to happen? I don't know. Why? Because I think... As it gets closer to August, after RNC and DNC, I think DNC is going to be in Chicago August 16. I think RNC is in July. And if the candidate on the left doesn't feel confident about what's going on, they're going to lobby for the Fed to make better decisions to help them with their election. So they need to decrease rates, lower rates, so the economy kind of starts flowing again and moving yeah. again. So if somebody's going to lobby uh, to call uh, Powell and say, lower the rates, that may happen, so I don't know. I think rates may start decreasing June, July, August. I don't know by how much, but I hope it stays flat next year. I think it's going to be a very big opportunity for individuals to rise up, show poise, show confident, realize what you can control, what you can't control, speak openly with people. Like mm -hmm. In seasons like that, the way you sell is the following way. Look, I don't need to tell you if you're watching the news. You know what's going on. We have an election year, uncertain. It's crazy. It's chaotic. The economy is strange. It's bipolar right now. You know, boom, boom, boom. You're probably seeing it with your 401k, with your savings at your job. People are getting fired. They're keeping the jobs. They're doing this. They're doing that. However, this is the approach we're taking. We suggest X, Y, Z. And here's what's working for us. It's going to be a lot of matter of fact type of speaking with people because that's what they're going to want uh, next year. But again, going back to it, I think the, uh, the opportunity in times like that, you know, uh, when I'm talking to Brady a couple months ago at the vault, you're mm -hmm. there. I, I, over the last 20 years, this whole concept of business planning for the audacious few. Guy asked me a question, he says, so, you know, isn't it a little bit aggressive to say, choose your enemies wisely? You know, isn't that like a Sun Tzu type of thing? Or isn't that like a little bit too much power in art my rebellion, all yeah, art yeah, of war? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, even he probably said, choose yeah. your enemies wisely. Sure. I said, no, but here's the thing you gotta be thinking about. I said, what you gotta be thinking about right now is, you know, when I watch guys in the last 20 years I did business planning. I first had no clue how to do a business plan for you as my new sales guy or sales leader. It was just more like, you can do it. What are your dreams? You want a car? You want to travel? You want to retire your mom? Let's go. Here's your plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, but he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. So what do we do now? Okay, no. All right, so now we got to be more uh, logical. What you need to do is you need to make this many calls and you need to run this many appointments. And you need to do this, this, then we got a little too logical. Emotions was bored, so okay. So what do I do? Well, we need emotion and logic. Okay, great. But emotion and logic in what area? Then it's like, no, new building blocks. Then you need, no, 12 building blocks. Six emotion, six logic. Interesting. Then based on that, I started seeing who moved better. I'm like, man, this guy has no clue what he's doing. But man, he wants to win for his mom so bad that he's crying. Okay. This guy knows exactly what he's doing. He's my best sales guy. But he's got no dreams and ambitions. He's happy, ambitions. He's happy making three, four grand a month. And no matter how I challenge him, nothing drives him. So, so, so then you start sizing people up. Okay, you start sizing people up. With Brady and some of these guys that went and competed at the highest level, you'll find three commonalities. 
These are guys that experienced unconditional love one time in their lives, okay? Where for you, it's your mom. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything wrong in your mom's eyes. <laughs> Nothing, right? You get arrested, you come to your mom, your mom's gonna be like, you okay? Everything good? Everything good? You're like, how could somebody love me this much that I just screwed up? Yeah. And you still love me? Yeah. Wow, yeah. right? We need to experience mm -hmm. that. Only one time is all you need. Because when you experience it one time, you know what it tells you? It's possible and it's out there. One time. Two, then you have somebody that you look at in your lifetime that no matter how much you try to earn this person's love, you could never do it. You make a million dollars, they don't care. You get a six pack, she's still with another guy. You drive a Lambo, she doesn't give a shit. You buy a 20,000 square foot house, doesn't do anything. No matter what you ever do, this person you loved so much betrayed you, left you, broke you for the rest of your life. You are never gonna win this person's confirmation. So you have unconditional love, unconditional, un unbelievable pain. Then you have the last one, is when you end up choosing the right person or enemy that drives you. Most people that last element met, they don't choose the right one. Like I remember one time you and I, I, like I can recite five of your enemies. I won't do it on the camera, <laughs> but I can recite five of your enemies. I remember one time we're talking on the phone, the first yeah. 90 days you were with us. Yeah. And it's me, you, and Sheena. This name would keep coming up, keep, keep coming up, coming up, coming up. I'm like, perfect. That's an enemy. And then another person was in your life that was making your life very difficult, another enemy. And then there was another person that really did something to Sheena, another enemy. And then I sat there and I talked to you guys about it. I think you remember this call that we had together where I'm like, guys, here's what you have to realize. Totally get it. He made this much money, here's what you gotta do. That person's doing this, go light it up so you don't have to worry about it. This person's doing that, here, and, and, I saw, and I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your eyes, and I'm looking at her eyes, I'm like, these guys are gonna get whatever they want. Why? Because you guys have the right enemies. Mm -hmm. And what happened to your life? Now making $2 million a year, living in a beautiful $3 million home, mm -hmm. having the family that you have, having the influence that you have, having the leaders, the lives you've changed. One of your guys' heart just crossed you know, 750. 750. You got guys yeah. making half of them, you got yeah. guys making a million no. dollars. And back in the days, Life was very different in that Escalade that every time you opened the door, it sounded like somebody was shooting at the car. Life changed. <laughs> Rusty hinges. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the point is, like... PB, in, I, what, was, that, was I, when, when she and I were talking to you about our yeah. enemies, were, were, can you share some, like, because, you know, I, I knew I was, I was talking about yeah. it like I was pissed, yeah. but did I sound helpless? Did I sound like I couldn't no believe it? No way. No okay. way. Okay. No way. No, no. Because I was angry. I was no. mad. No, you were angry yeah. is yeah. what it was. And, and the whole thing was, you know, to to try to stay in control and you know bring you above the level of anger to courage acceptance willingness neutrality reason love is to bring it up and when you went to that next level it just it just started happening yeah. no i would watch you guys so closely uh, you guys were the easiest people I've ever worked with in business, ever. In 22 years of anybody I've ever worked with, you guys were the easiest people to ever work with. Because you, you had the balance of the logic, and you just needed to figure out how to do it better. Sheena needed the systems, and like, how do we do this, and how do we do that? But you also had the emotion side. Like, you had the willpower. You had the vision. You had the mission. You had the culture. You brought culture. You brought these shoes. None of us wore <laughs> Jays. None of us wore Jays before you came. You brought the Jays where you started, you know, after we gave Dream Team, we started giving Jays sure. out. Yeah. And then you started having all these Jays, and then everybody started wearing Jays. So you were a culture guy. The, the, the Jays, well, when I came to PHP, I was wearing those Nike Roshis. When I saw you giving a Dream Team on my first convention yeah. in February 2020, I was like, they, Patrick gives out Jays. I've never, I've never had Jays. I remember that. And then I qualified for next year's dream team. And you gave my, and you gave me my first pair of Jays. After, after that, I was a Jay guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I don't know how many Jays you got. I've seen your closet, bro. You got, I don't know how many you got there. But, but, but the point being, you know, you, you, you could get the logic side, and you need that side. But you also had the emotion side. Like you had the willpower. The willpower is something that you can teach a little bit, but some just have it. Some just have more of it. Can it, be, can it be built in willpower? It, it, it can be, but the one thing that's gonna force you to know you need to build it is if you have the right enemy. Oh. If, if you don't have the right wow. enemy, why would you build your willpower? You know, sometimes like, you know, I'm sitting there talking to um, uh, 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 Brad Lee in Vegas two days ago, okay? We're at, we're at his office. And he was just super transparent and open with me. He's like, look, man, I'm rich as I've ever been. I got money, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, but I feel like I'm a little bit lazy and I'm this. He's joking, 
but maybe he's not fully joking. By the time we were done, Brad's eyes were on fire. All night he was texting me, morning, and we're just going back and forth. And one of the things I talked about is when we do affirmations sometimes, all we want to write when we do affirmations sometimes, we write positive affirmations. We write, you're the best, you're a great leader, you're a great father, all of these things that are positive affirmations. Okay, no problem. One day on a flight back from Chicago, I took a piece of yellow pad on a flight, and I wrote down everything anybody ever said that offended me, upset me, pissed me off, hurt me, those comments. Matt, I'm writing this down, and I'm on fire, and I'm getting emotional. And I'm just writing it down, and I'm writing it down, and I'm writing it down, and I'm writing it down. Imagine you start your day reading those 10 affirmations of what people say. About you. <laughs> your day starts slightly different, yeah, right? Yeah. And, you know, w when we're with Dana, and I'm sitting with Dana three days ago in Vegas, we're in his office, a 30-minute meeting turns into mm -hmm. a two-hour meeting. And I say, Dana, I got a book coming out at the end of the meeting. You know, he said, why are you, why are you here? He said, well, I got a bunch of meetings I'm doing for a book tour for Penguin. What's the book's name? Choose Your Enemies Wisely. He said, that's the name? I said, yeah. He said, the book's name is Choose Your Enemies Wisely. He says, yeah. I said, yeah. He says, look behind me, he's pointing. I'm like, if you want me to tell you what he had on his wall, it's a picture of two, anyways, on I, his I wall. I got you, I got you, yeah. okay. And I'm like, you all, I've already seen that picture. He says, no, no, this here. So I come to the side, I'm like, what is he looking at? What's he talking about? He's got a quote on the wall, and it says, may God have mercy on my enemies because I won't. Mm. When I tell you on the wall, it's like massive on the wall. May God have mercy on my enemies, for I won't. I said, can I take a picture with you that we go there? He says, you know who said this? I said, who said this? I said, a military guy? Is it a president? He says, no, it's military. I said, is it Ike? Is it Alexander? Is it Patton? He says, it's Patton. Patton said the quote, right? Then I said, you know you got a quote in the book. He says, really? I said, yeah, you got a quote in the book. He says, what, what's the quote? I said, well, it's the quote where you say, effing yeah. yeah. bet against me. Tell me it's not going to happen. Tell me it's going to fail. I love it. I love every minute of it, right? I played that on repeat. Mm -hmm. I love every minute of yeah. it. We're sitting there talking, and, and then he's explaining this stuff. And you look at Dana, what do you think about it? You think about a guy that chose his enemies wisely 20 years ago, you know, when he chose to be the best commissioner in sports during COVID where you couldn't play sports here. Yeah. And he goes to Abu Dhabi and the only thing that we can watch on TV was UFC. UFC sure. blew up during COVID, right? Yeah. He so went to, He went to Jacksonville, right? He went to Jacksonville because there was a conservative. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yes, he did. That's, that's right. Mayor. And by the way, he talk, we talked about yeah. that. And DeSantis also talked about that. But the, the point being, if you, if, you, if you have the privilege and the honor of being offended the right way, Man, if somebody offends you the right way and you know how to use it and channel it, because one of two things is going to happen, okay? I've had, I've had a list of people that have said things about me, but one of the guys once said something about me. I sat there and I said, if I don't do anything for the rest of his life, he's going to tell everybody he was right. There's no way that's going to happen. There's no way it's going to happen. So if you don't do something about it, they were right. Yeah. But if you do something about it, you were right. How does that drive you? Does it move you? Does it do anything to you? Yeah. If it does, you're going to get willpower. Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't, forget about it. One of my favorite trainings you've done, I've got, I remind my guys constantly about this, is reasons why you should never quit. And one of them, one of the reasons why is because everybody that told you you couldn't do it, they were right. And everything that you're supposed to become will never be, will never have a life because you, because you quit. You know, there, there's so much that you just covered there, PBD. I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, Dana White. I mean, he's got a recent viral video out there He's laughing at people that says, I don't want a nine to five job. He's telling me I want to work for myself. He goes, oh, really? Oh, really? You want to work for yourself? And he, Listen, man, there's no holidays. There's no birthdays. Everybody's trying to take out. Everybody's trying to screw you. It's, he's, he's war out there. So he's, he, he has a very serious message. He, of course, he says in the beginning. But did you experience that when you first started PHP? Did you experience that? Oh, when you, my God. At the highest level, of course. At the highest level. And by the way, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the bigger you get, right? But no, listen, you, 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 you do what you do in business because it's a dream, because you have aspirations, but it's not easy. It's not mm -hmm. easy when you're sitting around and people yeah. are telling you, 
you know, they're trying to steal your business from you. They're trying to steal market share away from you. Yeah. Everybody from, you know, all these recruiting companies are trying to pitch your company executive that you hired that they're going to get another raise over here. For, so mm -hmm. no matter how much raise you give. So let's just say you're like, oh, I'm going to keep this guy by giving him a $2,000 raise or $20,000 raise. You could give all of your guys a $20,000 raise, a $50,000 raise, a $100,000 raise. Still, 80% of them are going to use that to go to recruiting firm to get an additional 20. Yeah. So giving the yeah. raise will not be the solution. Yeah. Now, if you bring it back and you are a true leader, you are really driving. You're a guy that's nonstop. You're a guy that's fair but tough. You're a guy that has, has high standards. You're a guy that is on a mission. You're doing something. People can see the fact that you're real and genuine about it. Then people don't want to go work with another person. They want to work with you. So then if they want to work with you, and then they're able to also have their lives and dreams become a reality, yeah. then they're willing to go through the pain. But yeah, but starting a business, everybody wants to go out there and do it. It's always easier if you do it with somebody that's a partner. Uh, and my recommendation, instead of trying to be an entrepreneur sometime, you're better off being an entrepreneur. Find somebody like you to be in business with yeah. where you, know, you have somebody to leverage and you don't have to do it all by yourself. So PBD, when we're, we're looking at uh, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, I, I kind of find myself as a hybrid because, yeah, I can create my own entrepreneur efforts, but I have the benefit too of not worrying about a lot of things that you set up over here at PHP. I don't have yeah. to worry about compliance. I don't have to worry about new, new business. I don't have to worry about you know uh, marketing. I have to worry uh, uh, there's a whole. I have to worry about you know uh, commissions and, and being a CFO. I can just focus on what I do best, which is recruit, train, build, and get my guys to compete and, and, and drive competition. You know, for somebody that's out there that, that uh, may not be necessarily be a entrepreneur entrepreneur, uh, can you talk a little bit more about entrepreneur entrepreneur uh, and, and, and leveraging that platform or leveraging uh, uh, somebody that can take them to the next level? You look at Tim Cook. Tim Cook, uh, you know, founder, Steve Jobs, and Wozniak take the company from zero to 100 billion. Okay, Tim Cook takes the company from 100 billion to three trillion dollars. <laughs> Tim Cook is a billionaire. He's never started a business. I mean, not that it's a name that we know about. When we yeah. think about Tim Cook, what do we think about? Sure. We think about Apple, right? Sure. You know, you, you, you can look at Balmer. Balmer's right now worth what, 60 billion, 80 billion? I don't know what the mm -hmm. number is, but he bought the Clippers for 2.2 billion yeah. from Donald Th Sterling. Thankfully, that, ra ra that racist yeah, comment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then now the Clippers are worth 4.6 billion. He, was, he didn't start the company. He was a guy that was one of the entrepreneurs. Gates started the company, and Gates is worth, I don't know, 100 billion, 120 billion. Balmer's still worth 60, 70, 80 billion. He's right behind him. It's not like mm -hmm. it's that crazy of, an, of a number. No. You, you look. If you can be, if you can be as aligned to the role you play within an organization, everybody plays a different role. The sooner you know what role you play in any organization, the sooner you're going to have the biggest advantage. Not everybody needs to go out there and start a business, and not everybody's going to be a C-suite executive. Not everybody's going to be a CEO or founder, or and, and nor do they need to be. Mm -hmm. a, a, if everybody wanted to be a CEO of a company, if everybody did. You, you you wouldn't have the people that are willing to do the supporting. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. that needs to happen within it. So eventually, people realize. Like eventually, I realize, yeah, Pat, guess what? This dream you have of being Mr. Olympia, you're too tall for it. Six four, it ain't the height. Mr. Olympia is a six, you know, five eight, five nine, five ten, maybe five eleven height. Now, if you do want to go, could you compete in Mr. Olympia? Yes. At six four, do you want to be 400 pounds in off season? I do not. So when I'm in uh, Mr. Olympia and I'm seeing Aaron Baker and Cormier and I'm seeing Jean-Pierre Fuchs and I'm seeing some of these bigger guys, Paul Delette, and I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm not, I'm not going to want to be offseason. Greg Kovacs, I don't know if you remember this guy named Greg Kovacs, who had 26 and a half inch guns. He would, he would incline six plates. He would incline <laughs> six plates. I'm like, you know what? No, nope, bodybuilding <laughs> is not for me. I'm not going to do it. So to me, that was just like, yeah. I'm going to step aside. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else. So... Uh, yeah, if you can figure out a way to position yourself mm -hmm. with the right people, if there is the right alpha, right leader that you're working with that does most of the things you need to be doing and you can come and position yourself mm -hmm. and still bring value to the table, you're going to position yourself in a better way. Uh, I want to talk about coachability. That's one of the, when you wrote my forward for Faith Made Millionaire, by the way, I, I, what a great forward you wrote for me. It just got me uh, all teared up and got me jacked. Um, can you discuss what coachability is? Because sometimes people know what they want to know, know what they want to hear, they hear what they want to hear, and they don't want to know what they want to know. And, and sometimes it's just trying to combine those two together. Can you talk about uh, how to become more coachable? Yeah. So you know, uh, think about who's who's a bigger alpha in basketball than Michael Jordan? Who? 
Uh, nobody. Yeah. Alpha. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. And why was he so coachable to Phil Jackson? He's one of the most coachable guys yeah. uh, Phil Jackson had. Mm -hmm. How did that work out for him? Six championships. Yeah. Worked out pretty good for him. Now, Tex Winner is asked, who's the smartest guy ever you coached in basketball? He says, Jordan Farmar. He says, really? Jordan Farmar? Yeah. Which Jordan Farmar? The Jordan Farmar that played Lakers? Yeah. He's the smartest guy? Hmm. He says, yeah, you couldn't teach him anything. He knew everything. Hmm. So what happened to Jordan Farmar? He went and played in Europe or Asia or China or Puerto Rico, whatever. Done. He had a great game. Okay? But he knew everything. You couldn't teach the guy anything. Okay? In life... You know, this idea, like even right now where I'm at, I got a bunch of teachers around me teaching. I could be talking to a kid that's 16 years old who's been painting for five years. The guy knows more about painting than me. He's the teacher, I'm the student. Age is not the idea when it comes down to yeah. learning. It's a concept that you choose to continue doing uh, to get better. And coachability, you know, I, I, I uh, had a guy, have a guy that has been in business with me for, for a while. And I, I used to work with them years ago, and I used to say, man, this guy is super conceited, arrogant. This guy is very cheap, and this guy's got this entitled attitude. If he loses this, he's going to do good. Kept showing up. Every two years, oh, he would lose it. He would show back up. Four, oh, he would show back up. Six, oh, he would show back up. And it would show back up. And he eventually, you would hear, oh, this guy, you know, he knows it all. He's this, he's that. His idea was he wanted to say, I know everything. You can't do this and da 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 da. I'm this, 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 that. Yeah. It's okay, great. How to work out for you, you know? Yeah. And, and then eventually, what you don't realize is you produce those types of people in your life. And by the way, here's what's great about it. What's great about it is when somebody says, well, what if your way of teaching isn't the best way? Okay, so now you have two risks. If you think you are better than the coach, go prove it. The risk you have is, risk of not a proven method that you think you can do it better, but go prove it. If you do, you were right. If you don't, the market's going to say you were wrong. Sometimes we have guys that the coach that was coaching was too content and too casual and soft and conceited and, you know, cheap mm -hmm. and entitled. And he found somebody that was better than him. And this person was the better teacher. And that person's trying to coach this guy's like, no, nah, man, I don't think you're right. So it's also making sure the coach is the right coach. It's not just being blind, yeah. you know, following anybody that whatever they're teaching you is, you know, yeah, I'm going to go and listen to this guy because of what? No, you need the right coach as well. So if you're lucky enough to choose the right coach and if you're able to be coachable, you, you have the highest potential of winning at the highest level. Speaking of Michael Jordan, his... Uh uh, Bob Knight just passed away yep. uh, this, this past week, yep. uh, coach of uh, Indiana uh, uh, Hoosiers. And he was Michael Jordan's coach during the Olympics. And uh, there's a quote by, uh, I forgot who the, the player was, but he was talking about how his relationship was with Michael. He said he made Michael cry. Right? He made Michael cry because he said, Michael, that, that, was your, that wasn't your best game. How come, you, how come you're cheating us all about not giving us your best game? It got Michael to cry. It got him pissed off. But that was Bob Knight's strategy to get them to improve for the next game to redeliver. You know, they asked Michael, they said, so how different is it playing with Bob Knight, Bobby Knight versus uh, Dean Smith? He says, well, you know, uh, Coach Knight uh, curses a little bit more than <laughs> Coach Smith because Coach Smith doesn't curse. But you know what book Bobby Knight wrote? He wrote a book called The Power of Negative Thinking. He, he, and you know, what, you know what his concept of negative thinking was? It's not being negative. It was you can't do it. Mm. You ain't tough enough. You ain't strong enough. You're going to be soft. Let's see if you can uh, hang in when th times get tougher. Like that scene where, uh, 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 is it Edelman? Edelman is uh, the, the, the modern-day Wes Welker when he had Wes Welker. Wes Welker played with Tom Brady for eight years, never won yeah. a championship. But that scene with Edelman, you're old. Yeah. You're old. You can't do it. You're old. <laughs> you're too old for this. And Brady's just getting angry. It's like, ah, you know, it's like, you're too old. You're too old. And... Um, you know, so for me, the power of negative thinking doesn't work on everybody. Somebody may be watching and say, well, that doesn't work. But the power of negative thinking worked on Jordan. Sure did. It worked on him. The goat. It yeah. would work on Kobe. It, it works on Brady. But yeah. it doesn't work on, yeah. you know, Barbosa. It doesn't work on, 
you know, certain uh, uh, personalities that internalize that, and maybe I am bad, and maybe I am this, and maybe I am that, you know. Everybody's different, so you have to kind of, uh, like even raising your kids, you know, it's not going to work on all your kids, you know. Some of your kids, the more you give them a firm, they want to do more to make you proud. To some of you, it's like, maybe I think that kid wants it more than you do. Yeah. He's telling you, you think he wants more? You think he wants it more than me? I think he does. I'm going to show you. Yeah. you can't, that, it's not going to work on the same kids, mm -hmm. all of them. So that's why you got to kind of test to see what works. When Bobby wasn't for everybody, no. but for the right person, Bobby was the best. Yeah, yeah. He, he would be a coach that would go from zero to hundred and throw a chair in the yep. floor faster yep. than anybody. Um, I, I want to talk to you, uh, PBD, about uh, about fatherhood. You know, um, you know, I, I've got I'm officially now a grandfather. I'm, I'm meeting her this this weekend. Or actually, he's, he'll, he'll be, she'll be at the house in a couple hours. But uh, you know, you've always talked about values and principles, and ever since I came to PHP. And uh, I saw your boys running around the convention, and, and uh, you'd be in the middle of uh, uh, our gala night. And then, uh, and because at that time, PHP had a very, the, the average age was a little lower, and a lot of people weren't having kids yet. And so for people in PHP to see kids running around, is you're, you're challenging people to see how distracted they were versus paying attention to you, to see, you know, uh, Tico and Dylan running around. Say, oh, you guys aren't ready to have kids. They see you paying attention to the kids. Pay attention. You're, you're challenging everybody that night. But you've always raised them on values and principles. You're always raising on things. And you kept that as your affirmation. Yeah. And how, how do you go about creating your own values and principles? Was it the same process of you with the yellow pad on the flight home from Chicago uh, talking about, you know, things that went against you? How did you formulate your values and principles, what you stand Because even not only your children picked up, but people in PHP has picked it up. Yeah, we're, we're right now as a collective in PHP. We want to, we're raising some great kids, man. We're raising winners, <laughs> leaders, yeah. net positive to society. I love, yeah. if there's anything I love seeing with our guys, I love obviously the houses and the and financial freedom and all the good things that's happening. I love seeing our kids winning. I love seeing those video, the posts, the pictures. It excites me the most when I see that. But yeah, values and principles, you know, it's, it's the boring stuff, right? It's the stuff that you sit down and you think about and you say, you know, I want to raise my kids to do this. And you think about what your mom and dad did with you that worked and what didn't work. So whatever didn't work, don't apply it. Whatever did work, uh, apply it with your kids. And then uh, uh, also helps to read a lot because when I read the, you know, I, I don't know what book it was, 41 or something like that. I think George Bush wrote it about his father. And then when I read a book about Kennedy's family, you'll notice a couple different trends on how these families were. Uh, Arnold said in an interview one time when he met John F. Kennedy first, I'm not John F. Kennedy, one of the Kennedys the first time. He said, so what's your favorite color? Just a basic conversation. He says, uh, 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 they told me, we like red. W what do you mean? No, what's your favorite color? Yeah, we like the color red. Who's we? We Kennedys like the color red. Think about a family being so unified wow. that they like the color red. That, okay. Very simple, basic yeah. thing. RFK, I'm talking to RFK the first time I had him on the podcast a few years ago, and I said, Tell me what it is to be part of the Kennedy family. He says, every night was debate. Every night, my dad would say, what's wrong with having drugs being legal? What's wrong with this and what's wrong with that? And he would make us debate. And we would sit there and it's, you know, so, oh my God. And yeah. his dad, obviously, you know, uh. that was the culture of debate. Bush's family, hey, go make your money. Take care of your wife, take care of your kids, make sure they're scored away, set aside money for retirement. Then if you want to make a little bit more money, go do it. But then you got to do three things at the end. You got to give back to the country that gave you this life through charity, through church, or through politics. But you got to go give some way back. So that's one what, uh, method of public service. So those, those concepts are great. But I tell you this, when I was a kid, every year we would go to um, this man's house. His name is Luther al Hase, one of the most successful Assyrians uh, in America. His brother, Albert, this is how I always remember him, he's the only relative of mine that would give me $100 every Christmas. You know how you remember that mm -hmm. guy? This was the guy for me, <laughs> Albert. He was a $100 guy. Birthday, 100 bucks. Christmas, 100 bucks. Oh, back in the 80s Man, and 90s. I forward yeah. when Christmas would come with Albert. He'd bring that $100 bill. It was awesome, right? Everybody it was rare back like, then. Yeah, yeah. very. Like 100 bucks back then was like $300 today. <laughs> so I loved it. And he was so gentle with me. He was so good with me. He was just a sweet man, Albert. Till today, he's here. Luther passed away four years ago. But this is the part of the story that's wild. Luther becomes rich. One day the story is, whether it's mythical or it's true, it is what it is. He's at a bar, and one guy here is trying to sell a massive, massive truck that they move equipment from uh, Tehran, from Bandar Pahlavi to Russia, okay? And that's the business he's in. But 
he's going broke. Mm -hmm. So he needs to sell his truck. And Luther's like, dude, I'm not in the transportation business, but okay, how much you want for your truck? Oh, this one. So let me see what I can do. Then he says, he goes to the other side of the story, uh, uh, the bar, and another guy says, look, man, I don't know if you can do this for me. I need to move this big of a load from here to Russia in the next 48 hours, and I'm willing to pay this much money to move the load because my other guy can't do it now. So he's like, wait a minute, how much of a load is it? This. So he says, okay, let me get back to you. He comes over here and says, hey, how much of a load do you need? Uh, how much of a load can it take this much? Oh, that fits. Okay. How much did you want for this? Boom. He goes, how much are you willing to pay for this? Boom. What the money this guy was willing to pay to move the load, pay for the truck. So he says, you mind, I'll buy it from you, but you mind if I pay it here next <laughs> week. So he gets an advance from him, takes the advance, gives it to him, buys the truck, goes up, becomes a multimillionaire. Wow. Okay? And yeah. this is in Iran back in the days. Yeah. They leave Iran, they come to U.S. He had a house in Upland. You know where Upland is? Well, you don't know where Upland is. In California, Upland is... You know, Riverside County, mm -hmm. Upland. And there's a street called San Antonio that you would go to, and mm -hmm. Snoop lived there. You go to San Antonio all the way up. You go to his house, 7,200 square foot house he's got. And in that house, swimming pool, when you walked in, he always had a, a Cadillac and a Jaguar, and he had a big bird nest. When I say big bird nest, that should have been like 30 feet, 20 feet, very big, <laughs> and birds inside of it. But you walk in, open a door, office to the right. You walk in a little bit more, there's a hallway. Uh -huh. His bedroom's all the way to the end. With a, one time I got in there to see what it looked like. Living room here, you make a left, come in. Kitchen's here, big island. I would always sit all the way in the back by the window and I would watch these guys cook and talk. So if you come out of the kitchen, you go left, make a left again, there's a pool table here. Picture of his family, all dressed in white. And then to the corner here, there was a fax machine with a picture on the wall of him and Al Gore. He's a conservative, but he's got a picture with Al Gore. Mother, it's kind of weird, <laughs> but fine. Then over here, he had a big couch with a big screen TV that he would watch basketball. Da, 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 You remember back in the days, right? <laughs> and then you'd go outside. You got the swimming pool. You got the tennis court, basketball court. Then Alfred would uh, be over here above the garage. This is how he would always shake my hand. So he would shake my hand like this. He would always shake my hand like this. Okay. That was Alfred's way. This was our yeah. way of shaking hands. And, uh, and I would go and I would watch him. I would watch him so closely. I'm like, dude, how does this guy have all his kids love him? His grandkids love him. They all want to be around him. How did they build it like this? And his wife was unbelievable. I think she died before him. Mm. And, and then he would sit there and say, you know what? I've made a decision. Jesus doesn't exist. And tell me why he exists. And his kids would start debating him. And a fight would break out, debate. I'm like, this guy, the father, grandfather just started a fight. <laughs> and they would go. So every year, wow. once a year, I would come to this guy's house. Wow. Every year. Anyways. He inspires me to be an entrepreneur. Fast forward to four years ago. Four years ago, I'm at Rafi's place having dinner. His sister, Jackie, walks over. He says, hi, Patrick, John, how are you? How's Gabriel? How's Derek? How's dad? How's dad? Everybody's good. I said, is your dad here? Yes. Where is he sitting over there? I want to tell him something if that's okay with you. Okay. I walk over and I say, Uncle Luther, how are you? Great. And I'm speaking to him in Assyrian and like broken Assyrian, but I'm trying to tell him the story. I said, you're not going to know this. I'm not related to you. You're not my uncle. You're not my grandpa. You're not my father. But I'm an entrepreneur because of you. Let me tell you why. Matt, I go over 10 minutes explaining him exactly what his house looked like, explaining how I studied him like a hawk wow. on what he would do to his kids, how loving he was to his grandkids, how tough he was how much of a hustler he was. At a wedding one time, we're there. He's dressed in this money outfit like seven, eight years ago, and he's raising money. He's asking, at a wedding he's raising, I don't know what this was. I'm like, this just became a fundraiser, comfortably getting up there and asking people if you really want to make a difference, we're thinking about doing this, and he's selling the truth. I'm telling all of this stuff to him. He's crying in the middle of Rafi's. And then, um, you know, a year or two years later after that when he died, I'm glad I talked. I said, I'm an entrepreneur where I'm at because I, I said, my dad's my hero. I said, but you're the reason I became an entrepreneur. Did he, did he know who you were at the time? Of course. Okay, okay. No, we're family, but we're not okay. blood. Gotcha. But we're family. But he knows and, who PBD is. Yeah, I mean, but okay, I had I gotcha. to tell him that. By the way, when yeah. this man died, when Luther Akhasa died, uh, the Shah of Iran's son posted a picture and wrote about him because this is, this is a very heavyweight man. Wow. Like, he's a leader amongst yeah. leaders. Yeah. He's one of my guys. Like, mm. he's a guy that I just salute. So, yeah. where am I going with this? You asked the question, how'd you come up with your values and principles? It's the people you admire and you study over your lifetime. We say, I like the way he did this. I like the way she did this. 
I like the way that family did this. And then you add your own twist to it, and you're like, what if I add this to the recipe? Wow, so let's just say eight things you picked up from somebody else, and you add your own three or four things. And you're like, wow, this is good. Let me put a little bit of this. And then you kind of have that happen, and then you say, okay, we're going to find out if these values and principles are effective, but it's going to take us 10, 20, 30, 40 years. My kids are, the oldest one is 11. You know how long it's going to take for me to realize if my, what I'm doing right now is right? Probably 30 to 50 years. Probably 30 to 50 years, mm -hmm. because the best way to judge how great of a parent you are is by your, your grandkids, not by you. Yep. You know, my, my dad, if, my, if his grandkids become leaders, he did a good job, but I'm still questionable. <laughs> the way I'm going to oh, wow. be a okay. good parent is by the way their kids do in life. So yeah. I'm probably not going to know that for until I'm dead. Yeah. It's going to take yeah. 50 years, because I'm, I'm an old father. It's going to take 50 years to find out what they're going to be doing. So. That's, that's the answer, it's a long-winded answer to your question yeah, about how important. Yeah. I come up with values and principles for the family. So, so when, when, you're, when you are in that conversation, come up with these values, because I remember when you helped us create our values and principles with PHP, you flew us out to Jekyll Island, where we're there, the Federal Reserve Room, we were lock, locked up, we didn't know where we were going, but you put us on a private jet, crazy experience, and first thing we came up with, I, we never, first one was, I come through with my word, right? And so we, we, we and then for next, Couple of days, we were wrestling for hours over one word, and you know, that experience there. So, when when you're looking at uh, some of the most influential families, and when you're looking at the Bet David family, I remember uh, the the story you, you you constantly tell all the time about how the hospital treated your father. You, you'll never treat another Bet David like that again. Our, our name is going to be remembered. Was that another version of you choosing your enemy wisely? Uh, was, was that an enemy for you? Hundred percent. Yeah. Listen. Let, let me read something. By the way, I'm going to say this so nobody knows, so everybody sees this in the video as well. I got a note in the, in the book. Open it up so you can read it. Open oh, okay. up, there's a note on okay. page two for you. Okay, right there. Wow. Okay, read it. Okay. Uh, you read it <laughs> yourself. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and it's the truth, right? <laughs> It's the truth, you're the first person in PHP that's getting a copy of this. This is not right. live until December 5th. And I said, nor PHP nor my life would be the same without you, okay? For the rest of our lives, I'm gonna tell the kids about this man named Matt Sapala. I'm gonna tell them about you, guy. For the rest of our lives, I'm gonna tell them about this. Um, but you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you look at this thing here, which choose your enemies, Oh man, I got a lot of respect for you, Matt. I got a lot of respect for you. But I want, I want to read this to you because this whole concept with me at the hospital that day, right? Uh, 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 Baltazar Gracian once said this, a wise man gets more use from his enemies than a fool gets from his friends. Interesting, okay. Let's see what Charles McKay had to say. Charles McKay says, you have no enemies, you say. My friend, the boast is poor. He who has mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small is the work that you have done. You've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cup from perjured lip. You've never turned the wrong to, the, to right. You've been a coward in the fight. Okay? Okay. I'm at UCLA Medical Center. My dad's in a hospital bed. He had a heart attack. They're not even taking care of him. I'm in the car crying like a little baby in the Ford Focus. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I don't like the way they're treating my dad right now. I don't like that. Then we go to a Christmas party at 25 years old with a bunch of Assyrian relatives, great people. But one of the guys made a sarcastic comment about my dad. It was so subtle. Matt, if I tell you how subtle it was, it's, you're going to say that's what offended you? He said what he said. And all I looked at is my dad's face. And I just saw my dad go a little bit from this to this. Okay? You get what I'm saying? Huh. He went to this. Huh. And I said, yeah, okay, no, we're leaving. He said, what do you mean? I said, we're leaving. We're not leaving. We just got here to the Christmas party. I said, no, we're not, we're not staying. We're leaving. And the guy standing in front of us listening. So what are you talking about? I said, we're leaving. It's my family. We're here. It's the Christmas. I brought you. I said, no, we're leaving. We're not leaving. I said, Dad, I'm your ride. We're leaving. He's embarrassed, obvious reasons. He says what he says to everybody. Hey, boom, boom, boom. We leave. 
fight me all the way to the car. We get to the car, we get in the car. I said, no one will ever talk to you this way ever again, especially these people whose lives you changed. You're the kind of friend every man needs to have and wants to have. They trust you. You are very fair and straight up with these guys. That's what he wants to say to you, no problem. 30 minutes I'm screaming in the car, I'm so pissed. Whew. I call my sister and my brother-in-law, Siamak. They come out of the house the next day, Sunday. And I made a promise. I said, Dad, they're gonna have to kill me, but the world is gonna remember your last name, but David, and on top of that, they're gonna remember how great of a father you've been to me. Because it's gonna get to a point that when you go out, anybody and everybody that knows who I am, they're gonna tell you how great of a father you are. So watch what happened last week. My dad goes in the hospital because he needs to do another angiogram. The surgeon, the doctor comes in to do the angiogram on him. He was <laughs> in the hospital for five days, not feeling good. The doctor comes in and he says, I know who you are. He says, really? How do you know who I am? He says, two reasons why I know who you are. One, because your son always talks about you. <laughs> he says, but two, there's only one other nose I've seen like that. <laughs> and it's Patrick B. Davis' nose. And my dad's telling me this and he's laughing while he's telling me this, right? But it was a promise I made, and I'm going to continue to make until the day I die that's going to be taking place. What happened? One man makes a comment about my dad, and my dad's body language changes, and I'm off to the races. So you can call it whatever you want. I couldn't say, well, I've always had willpower. No, willpower is here. Someone's got to bring it out, right? I can say, well, you know, I always know how to create culture. No, culture is here. You got to bring it out. Well, I always knew how to, you know, go out there and do run a company. I've never known how to run a company. I've never yeah. read like I've, I've never been that guy. Yeah. So all of a sudden, that cause. My dad told today, you want to talk about power of negative negative uh, uh, power of negative thinking? thinking. So in my life, most boys and kids have trophies. I've never won anything in my life up until the age of eighteen ever. Listen, I have one trophy my entire life. The only trophy we ever got my entire life that my dad kept one trophy is when I was part of Century City Basketball Association, and remember how I said Luther al Jose, his son Vladimir, Ladi, he was the coach of Century City Basketball Association. It was a community of, they would bring troubled teens and gangsters, MS-13, Black Diamonds, Blood, Crip, all those guys, and we would play basketball. They'd be shooting all this stuff, and we'd run at Echo Park, bad place. But, you know, you, 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 you come to the house after that day, we're playing, seven of our players don't show up, but we're like, we still want to play anyways, and we're playing against the best team in the league. We lose by 101 points, okay? <laughs> I scored six <laughs> points in that game. Hey. <laughs> we lost by 101 points, and they gave a participation trophy to my dad. Part Till today, he's kept that trophy. <laughs> and you know what the, it the is? To remind you how bad you once were. <laughs> <laughs> that's my dad's sense of humor, though. You know, my, my negative thinking. That's the part, though. It's like, listen, that right. trophy till today. I wouldn't. You can pay me all the money in the world. We're not selling that trophy. Mm. That trophy's got. You know where that trophy's at? In his bedroom. Till today, yeah. he lives in our house. Yeah. Till today, that yeah. trophy's in his bedroom. So, no, I think I think you gotta you gotta. When these types of things happen, you gotta use them. If you if you waste it in that moment, that emotion goes away. It's gone. Mm -hmm. You have to use it in the moment when it happens. One one of your uh, uh, famous teachings to us in Mag 7 calls. Yeah, I, I asked you one time, I said, PB, what's, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from building a big shop, building, building a team, building an organization, building a company? And you said locking onto the wrong person. Locking onto, and, and so you've learned how to lock onto the right person. And speaking of uh, Dana White, I remember you, you explained to me a story of Dana White. He walked into uh, his house and there's a, a picture of Chuck Liddell and he also said, I also locked onto the wrong person before, before that guy. And that was, that was Tito Ortiz. That's right. So can you, can you explain a little oh, bit more about the experiment? Yeah. Locking on the wrong yeah. person can yeah. ruin your life. It can steal years away from your life. Um, no, it's just, look, the longer you're around, what you realize and what you value gets clear. At first, it's all like, oh my God, it's so exciting, it's so sexy. You're locking onto what's sexy. And then you realize sexy is not enough to get to the next level. You know, who, who, one guy speaks better, he's got fancier degrees, and it's like, but no, that person's not the right person to lock onto. So in the book, there's a section in the book that it's a chart. I created this chart because I kept locking onto the wrong person until eventually I needed a system because I'm a systems guy. So we created a system on finding a running mate, okay? <laughs> and it's six categories on what to look for and how to score them. Once I'll give you three of them, character, uh, um, uh, 
uh, uh, contact, uh, um, trust, and I scored these people in different categories, right? And you sit there and, you know, you say, okay, let's see what this guy's at. At, at a maximum score of a 60, he scored 38. This is not the guy to work with. Mm. At, a, at a maximum capacity of a 60, this guy scored a 48. Okay, we got somebody here. But there's a couple categories that if they scored low, even if they, they got perfect on everything else, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's just not worth it. You know, it, it, Elon Musk's book, I don't know if you finished it yet or not, Elon Musk's book comes out, it's like a couple thousand mm, pages. Yeah. Big, thick book, like That's job right. book. Yep. Massive, yep. right? And in the book, uh, uh, he gives his commandments, okay? And a couple th things he talks about in this book, which is freaking fascinating, uh, he says the following. He says the five commandments. Uh, question every requirement, delete any process you can, simplify and optimize, accelerate t uh, cycle times, automate, that comes last. Then the algorithm had other updates, additional five things he added. Number one, camaraderie is dangerous. Interesting. It makes it hard for people to call each other out. There's a tendency to not want to throw a colleague under the bus when you become friends with them, hmm. even though you know they're wrong. Okay? Hmm. So it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to say, let Pat say it. Man, I'm not going to say anything to because we're friends, but it's my boy. I can't say anything to him. It's yeah. problematic. Companies will fall because yeah. somebody's not willing to call out a colleague, right? Yeah, right? So we created a culture where it's like, well, such and such said this. Okay, what'd you do about it? No, I'm just bringing it up to your attention. Why don't you do something He's about right. it? Yes, you, Why you, bring it up to us. Yeah. Call him out. Yeah. Well, and then I would follow up a week later. You didn't call him out. Two weeks, you didn't call Oh, so you're scared of him. That's what yeah. you are. You're not, you, you, you're not ready to be a leader. If you can't call out a teammate, what makes you think you're a leader? Call him out. Yeah. And it, oh my God, but what if he says, what if he says it? Call him out. I said, like, okay, I'm going to call him out. I was that guy. I was yeah. the guy that would call out my peers, and I was the guy that you almost couldn't get too close to. You'd get close, and I'm like, shit, every time this guy's like constantly doing that because camaraderie could become that little, you know, where, where I'm not telling you what mm -hmm. areas, blind spots that you may have. Like, look at the second one. It's okay to be wrong. Just don't be confident and wrong. Three, never ask people to do something you're not willing to do. Great. When hiring, Look for a positive attitude. A skill can be taught. A positive attitude cannot be taught. You ready for the last one? Oh, go. my gosh. This is, this is like all me, the last one. A maniacal sense of urgency is a must. Let me read it again. Mm. His words. A maniacal sense of urgency is a must with musk. A maniacal sense of urgency is a must. So what's the point? Hey, can you call this guy and tell me what he's asking? Yeah, I'll call him. 30 minutes later, you haven't called him. Why haven't you called him? Well, I'll call him. Call him. Call him right now. You ain't doing nothing. Right, right. Call him. So, so you would watch. And you're like, okay, hey, um, this book is a good book for you to read. A month later, did you read the book? Oh, I haven't ordered it yet. You're the wrong guy to work with. Mm -hmm. I just told you order the book. I need to tell you 17 times. It's the right book for you. And so, hey, here's what I would do if I read. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'll get to it. Don't do it. A week later, you're the wrong guy to lock on to. So the speed of taking counsel and how quick you move shows there is not the willingness to want to improve and you lack urgency. So now, one time it doesn't happen, it's fine. Two times it doesn't happen, concerning. Three times you don't do it, it's a pattern. That's just who you are. You don't move that quickly. I don't have time to wait for you to choose to move at the speed. So if I got you and I got him I'm working with, I give the same recommendation. You, within a week, read it and send me an email on nine things you learned from the book. He takes three months, and then the next time I challenge you and I say, I would go to this event and learn this, 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 that. You do. He doesn't. Takes him six months. The next time I say, hey, can you call these three guys and get back to me and tell me what they wanted from this? You call them like this. It takes him next day. I give you five leads. You call the leads within five hours, within one hour. He calls the leads by the end of the night. I'm wasting my time working over there. Mm. If he's got better degrees, better whatever, it can be all that stuff. I'm wasting my time. You're positive. He's not. What am I doing working with the other guy? It's a waste of my time. So in companies, like... I'm reading this book because right now we're, we're, we, my, my obsession right now is recruiting 10s in a company. And 10s are very expensive. But you can recruit a 10 that is coming for the money, but they don't care what company you're working for. Then you're not recruiting a 10. You're renting a 10. Ooh. I want to recruit a 10 <laughs> that believes in the vision, believes in the mission, believes in the cause, dying to be here, and it's worth a lot of money to pay. Yeah. I want that guy. Steven Schwartzman in his book, Steven Schwartzman's a $30 billion guy. He's the guy where him and Larry Fink had a fallen out. Fink goes, does BlackRock, ESG, bullshit, bullshit. Blackstone <laughs> here is Steven Schwartzman, okay? Steven Schwartzman, a $30 yeah. billion guy. Yeah. His book is one of the must-read books out there. In his book, he talks about 
they start noticing the difference between having tens and high rank eights. And it's very common between him and Reed Hastings. For Netflix? From Netflix, yeah. No Rules Rules. Mm -hmm. They realize it's, whatever the number is, a 10 is the equivalent of 28s. Wow. So guess what? If an eight is a $200,000 year salary guy, but a 10 is 20 times the eight, what do you pay the 10? Think about that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Is that going to be a $3.2 million person? Talking to Tommy Matola, Tommy, like, Tommy, hey, how'd you take Sony from 800 employees to 13,000 employees? And you've represented, he was Holland Holt's first manager. You've represented Frank Sinatra. You've represented Shakira, Celine Dion. You've represented, you know the song with Celine Dion, by the way? That was the day she was coming in to do the draft. That's not the, when she came in, she had two cups of coffee, and she normally doesn't do that before singing, and she was just coming to show the song, I think she did for uh, Lion King. I think she did the Lion King song, whatever song it is. She came in, not feeling like she's going to perform. She came off the plane. On the first time they sang the song, that's the song that we all listen to for the rest of our wow. lives. She never did it twice or three times. First time, she said, that's freaking sick. You're on fire. They used it. This is him. Then he brings Michael Jackson, calls him the devil. Michael Jackson said, you're the devil because he negotiated a contract. You're upset at him. I said, Tommy, how'd you do it? He says, I had, I had six generals. I said, what'd you pay these generals? He says, eventually I have to pay him a lot. I said, what's a lot? Somewhere between one million to six million a year. I said, okay, that's all I need to know. Got it. So I'm looking for my guys right now, the tens that bought into the vision. Yeah. And I know at, at, at this level, we can't pay them the money because the company, you know, we're not yet doing something. But eventually, you're going to have to pay them. Yeah. With you guys, I found you as a general. At that time, you were making 160 a year. Now, you're making 160 a month as your minimum wage. <laughs> Think about it. 160 <laughs> times 12 true. is it's your minimum it's wage. True. But you're making 160 yeah. a year at that time. Now yeah. you're making 2 million yeah. a year. Vargas, what a general. Both yeah. of you guys took the lead with yeah. the company, took it to a whole different level. So now a company, you look at us where we are, you know, yeah. company's grown to, it's no longer, hey, it's PBD, PHP has got you, you got Vargas, you got Palayo, you got Gaines, you got Hearts, you got all these yeah. people that are doing what they're doing, Orianas, you got all these people that are doing what they're doing, Ricky and Erica, all these people that are doing what they're doing. How did that happen? And they, they chose to lead. You know, they chose to, and you have to find your general. So for me, everything right now, all I think about right now when it comes onto the business, Matt, I'm in hardcore recruiting mode. That's all Still. I think about. Oh my Still. Gosh. Are you if, But I thought you made it, PBD. Oh, oh my God. If you, you only could. knew <laughs> if you only knew what we're gonna be doing next, um, I am so excited about the next twenty to forty years. So excited. PBD, remember what I asked you to tell me? Um, the power, power of negative thinking. Remember we're having dinner there at uh, where were we? We're at uh, Capitol Grill. You're sitting across the table. We, we just crossed over two million bucks. I said, "PB, tell me this right now." <laughs> I remember, remember, but I, I, tell me I can't make five million. Tell me I can't make three million. I remember that. Yeah. Tell you're me not, I can't make it. You, and he says, "You're not making real money yet." <laughs> I'm making two million. You're not making real money yet. But I see you constantly. That's that's why you're such an amazing example to us all. Not just in PHP, but listen, the world is validating you. If, if anything, the world is validating. I mean, when you start value tainment, I remember at three thousand, four thousand, five thousand subs. Now you just crossed over five million subs in value tainment. Uh, uh, we're, we're hosting events, and, and I asked you this call, and I'm actually going call, Pat, Patrick, you're filling up 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people at the vault. People are paying 1,000, 10,000 being in the front seat, 1,000 just to get in the door. You're, you're, you're filling in butts and seats. The, the influencers of the world want to be on your podcast. It's because you've never settled. You, and, and you told me, hey, Matt, uh, there's things I want to do. I, I feel so broke right now. I was like, what? So can you tell me about that constant level of constant never ending improvement? Well, the vision is real, so that's one thing. So for me, I, I would watch guys, and I would watch to see who's real, who's not. I called Vargas the other day, and I, we were FaceTiming the other day when they crossed two million. I said, you know, I want to tell you something. I think it's very important for you to hear it from me. He says, what's that? I said, do you remember we're at El Fornayo, San Diego, after Top Gun, you had won a small mini iPad, and <laughs> You know, we're at this event that was Moral's first event or Kahindi's first event, whatever it was. And Greg is sitting there and we're having dinner and you're making 50 grand a year at the time. And you're like, Pat, we're going to be our biggest guys. Da, da, da. I said, Rodolfo, wait till you make a quarter million dollars a year and see what happens to you. No, 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 no. Okay, great. So we made a quarter million dollars. And they kept going. Then one day I'm on a drive to Austin. Me and Tikran, we're going somewhere. We're going San Antonio drive tanks. I don't know where we're going, but we're on a drive. The drive tanks is where we're going, San Antonio, to make blow up stuff and you know drive tanks. <laughs> right. And I was concerned about Rodolfo, and I called him. It was me and Tikran. I said, I just want to tell you something. So what's that? I said, you know where you are right now? He says what? 
I said, you've reached a level right now that you officially make money and you no longer need me. Mm. I said, so let me tell you what's the problem with that when you get to that point. He says, what's that? I said, you don't have to listen to me. You don't have to be coachable. You don't have to do anything. You officially have the ability to go to a million, two million, three million, four million, and now you have enough money in the bank that whether you listen to me or not, it's not going to affect your life. It is what it is. I said, but to get to the next level, your victory is going to be yours if you go from 750 to 2 million. It's not going to be my victory. It's more and more credit going to you as you're climbing your next mountain, right? right. Okay. And he crossed, I said, I just want to tell you, I'm proud of you because at $50,000, and when you were making $6,000 a year, and you went back to El Salvador to marry Ceci, and you came back down, and you told me this at, J, at uh, 4th of July 2009 or 2010, while we're in D.C., you were going to go back getting married. If, if, if I'm right, they probably got married July of 2010. Mm -hmm. He probably got married July 9th, and I don't even know when they're... Matter of fact, we should ask him right now, what's your anniversary? I'm curious right now. What, what, yeah, I'm going to yeah. ask him right now, exactly when did you guys get married? What exact date did you get married in El Salvador? I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. He's going to watch this. I'm going to yeah. guess it's July. It's between July 8th to July 15th, maybe July 10th of 2010 when they got married. He'll tell me right now where it's at. But to go from there, and you keep the word and you get to this point. Now, here's the thing. One day I'm talking to George, and I tell George, I said, George, who do you think is your number one person on your team? He's giving me all these names. I said, nope, nope, nope. I said, the number one person you got on your team is Rodolfo and Ceci Vargas. And they're field associates, right? And they're field associates. They're nobodies. They're making 20 grand a year. I said, he said, why do you say that? I said, number one, uh, July 17th. I said, it, July 17, 2010, <laughs> okay? I said between July 10th and July 18th, they got married July 17th. Are you okay? always amazed how fast your guys get back to you? He's making $2 million a year, and certain people send a text well, message no, to that's not everybody, but yeah, that's yeah. the group. That's the expectation yeah, yeah. where you got to be accessible and you got to be quick to get back. Um, but, but yeah, so I said it's going to be them. Why? Men and women of character, they love each other. Rodolfo's not a party guy. I've never seen Rodolfo flirt with other girls. Ceci. Ceci fully submits to her husband. And Rodolfo is a leader. He's got pride. He wants to make his mm -hmm. family proud. I've seen Rodolfo cry. Rodolfo has enemies. Rodolfo makes, wants to make his family proud. He wants to be dependable. He can make a lot of... So, so you look at the two of you guys, what you did. Boom! And now you're at a level that you are today. So, but as you get bigger, so you're asking me the question on what I'm doing. The more money you make, the less someone's going to expect you to continue. So, so the more money you make, the less someone's going to have high standards of you. Like, who the hell, who yeah. calls you to say, where are you at the office? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> who says, how many appointments you ran this week? How many calls you made this That's week? Right. That's right. How much business you ran this week? How much content, how, much, how many books you're reading right now? Who the hell says that to you? Nobody says that to you, right? right. So what do you do in that level? Oh, my gosh. That's when you realize what you're all about. Because when you won, yeah. when that person was in your life, you won because that person was in your life. Now, if you don't recreate yourself and get to the next level, the market's going to say, you were a great, you had a great coach, but you're not a great coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got it. I don't know if yeah. you understand the yeah. point I'm trying to make yeah. to you. You know, even if you're, a lot of you guys make money, but you did it when you had a coach. So the pride's got to, like, when I started PHP, nobody was holding me accountable. Who the hell is telling me what to do? My wife? Yeah. Who? My dad? Yeah. Who? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Well, I don't need to come to the office and stay here till 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, Paul remembers. Paul knows my schedule, what it was like mm -hmm. here. He's never seen me call sick. I've never called in sick. <laughs> so do you know in the last 20 years of working, if you ask yeah. anybody that worked with me, how many times I've called in sick, the number has got to be... I, I don't know what the number would be. I would love for people to say that. Yeah. But that was the personal pride. It's such a personal pride for you to have self-respect in a mirror to say, dude, I'm proud of you. There's a few magical people in your life that when they say the magical words, right, one of them is who? You want to hear your mom tell you you're proud of you. If it's the mom that always tells you you're proud of you, it doesn't mean that much, okay? If, if your dad doesn't tell you he's proud of you all the time, it, you know, and then he all of a sudden one day tells you at 26 years old, you're like, oh my gosh, that felt great. I remember the first time my mom told me she was proud of me that I believed it. And I felt like it was worth it. 26 years old, I'm at Cerritos at, uh, 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 at what do you call it, Fam's office, okay? No kidding. And Anaheim. I hadn't seen my mom for okay, seven yeah, years. Yeah. I hadn't seen my mom for five, six, seven years. Wow. And she flew in. I'm at the airport. I'm picking her up. She's looking like, 
I'm right in front of her. I said, hi, I'm your son. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, what are you doing in a suit? She'd never seen me in a suit. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, so then I take her straight <laughs> and we go and speak at Anaheim. And she's on the side, she's seen me, you know, talk to all these people, Armando, all these people, you know who these yeah, people are. Sure. Um, Armando was really respectful to me, and I always, I always yeah. liked that. But, yeah. um, like uh, uh, you know, and you're like, man, I'm proud of you. So like, interesting. My dad was coming back from, you know, Queen Mary Ballroom, and that night when I become an MD, and he's like, hey, I'm proud of you. Okay, I believe you. But as, as great of a feeling those two were, there's nothing like when you can say it to yourself, okay? Well, you can say it and say, I'm proud of you, okay? Uh, and then there's different levels of I'm proud of you. Because you know the example I gave of one of the guys that's that at the beginning when I was trying to coach him, and he was so begging to work with us mm -hmm. in the office. He was like, man, I'd do anything to be working with you guys. Yeah. He gave glimpses of entitlement. He gave glimpses of arrogance. And he gave glimpses of being cheap, okay? And I try to get that out of him to realize these are not attractive qualities. They're going to haunt you. And eventually people are going to realize you look at everybody as a way to use them. If people eventually think you're just using them as a piece to get what you can out of them, mm -hmm. you can't fake that for too long. People will know it. So watch this. How does somebody, does somebody can all of a sudden get rid of those feelings? No. Uh, that's part of an old identity of yours you have. An alcoholic. When somebody stays so sober for four years or six years or 10 years or 20 years or whatever, whatever the n number is, what, what will it take for that person to go become an alcoholic again? Can that happen at any given time? It happens all the time. And they fall, right? But you have to start off by knowing you have an issue with what? Alcohol. Alcohol. Some people have to know they have an issue with what? Arrogance, entitled, cheap, and it's unattractive. That's your alcohol. You don't even know it. Some people have to do with arrogance. Some people have to do with laziness. Some people deal with distraction. Some people it's women, some people it's porn. Some people it's drugs, some people it's video games. Some people it's food, some people it's constant surgery. Some people it's, but no matter what, that's your alcohol. We look down on alcoholics, but we don't look down at people that are super cheap, you know, mm -hmm. entitled and, you know, yeah. arrogant. But yeah. hey, you're no different than an alcoholic. He's having a hard time yeah. giving it up. Yeah. You can't give it up, right? They're all vices. So, yeah, yeah, they're all vices. So, so for me, the idea we're at a certain level later on where you have all the money, you can't stick around and tell people F you this, F you that, and you choose to be humble, yeah. you choose to be giving, you choose to be grateful, oh my God, yeah. that's when you get this. At this phase of my life, Matt, every year I've eliminated people out of my life and they never know when I do it. <laughs> Okay. No one ever knows it. Okay. Every year, I do this. You, so you don't put a Facebook oh, status update? I, I would uh, I would <laughs> But every year, I say, you know what? And, and by the way, it's very hard for me to do that. It's not easy for me to do it. Okay. I'm telling you right now. Because every, everybody I eliminate, I love. It's got nothing to do with love. Hmm. So I'll sit there. I've been doing this for 20 years. Is it because they're a net negative or net positive to you? Because, uh, I, you know, you'll see elements where you're like, yeah, it's, it's just not values that I live by. Huh. Now, you choose to live by those values, more power to you. But it's not values that I'm choosing to live by. So I had to do it early on with God knows how many. I remember one of my friends, he calls me. I love this guy. Till today, mm -hmm. I love this guy. I love this guy. Only guy that ever let me live with him for 18 days, okay? I love this guy. I can use the word love because I love this guy, okay? But... Everything to him was partying, girls, women, weed, constant. Didn't take his career so seriously. He was talented, charming, handsome, attractive, great salesperson, phenomenal. And one day, he's calling. He says, hey, Pat, man, you know, dude, we're going to the club. The girls are asking, you coming or what? No, nah, I'm good. I miss the old Pat. Ne this is the first time that it hit mm. me when he said this to me. I'm like, I miss the old Pat. I get off the phone. He said, man, the old Pat was fun. This new Pat, man, I don't yeah. know, like, none of us like the new Pat. Yeah. We miss the old Pat. I get off the phone. I'm like, uh, okay, this hurts. Cool. So what do I do? Do I go to the old Pat and compromise my vision of where I want to go to next? 
Uh uh, I'm not doing that. Do I continue loving this person? Absolutely. But do I have to distance myself from this person? 100%. What happened? Complete distance. In the last 19 years, I've probably seen him eight times. But this was a guy I saw every day. We worked at Burger King together. <laughs> this was my guy. Mm. So every year, I move on certain people in my life because I'm like, yeah, I don't relate to your values anymore. We're not the same human beings anymore. And it's moving on. So but you still love them. Oh, yeah. the love is permanent. Yeah. There, yeah. There is, there, lo, love, is, yeah. love is a whole different, and I'm rooting from a distance. Yeah. You see, when you're, when you're climbing and you're improving yourself, yeah. you don't have envy in you. Yeah. You're not like, wow, I hope my kids do better than your kids, and I hope it, that doesn't exist in you. That yeah. thought is not, like, I, yeah. I don't even know what that is. Like, you know, it's like yeah. they, they come to a certain tribe, and they're like, how come nobody, has, nobody stutters here? Man, there's 5,000 people, how come nobody has stutter? <laughs> and the guy asks, what is stutter? What do you mean, what is stutter? You don't know the word stutter? Do you know what stutter means? What is stutter? Do you know what stutter means? Stutter? What does that mean? You guys don't know the meaning. No. None of you guys stutter here. No. Because you don't know the word stutter. No. Now, whether this is a true story or not, I've read in a book. That's irrelevant. The whole idea is mm -hmm. what? If you don't know a feeling and an emotion yeah. that crawl or comes into you, you don't know what it, you don't, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not envious because I'm playing ball. I'm going here. Envy only comes when you're going here. Uh -huh. Envy only comes when you're going this way. Yeah. Envy only comes when you're bitter and entitled and arrogant and conceited. And all. Yeah. Envy doesn't come if you're playing ball. Yeah. You can compete. Yeah. You can be like, yeah, I want to go get X, Y, Z, but envy doesn't exist. So, yeah. And you're not willing to do the work. No, yeah, you're, you're not willing yeah, to do yeah, the work. work. That's yeah. the key word. You're yeah. not willing to pay the price. Yeah. You're not willing to keep your word. You yeah. said you're going to do something. You don't do it. That's the stuff when I said, yeah, give you a perfect example. You know this guy. When I explain to you this guy, you're going to know who it is. So four years ago, this guy who works with me, he's been with me for 19, coming up on 19 years, okay? Four years ago, he can't stop drinking. And this has been going on for 10 years. But it's getting worse and worse and worse, mm -hmm. okay? Sunday night calls we're doing. Hey, so, okay, so here's, I said, you drinking again? No, why do you think I'm drunk? I said, because you're drunk. <laughs> Get off the phone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to you. Boom. Okay, so help him with this, help him with that, help him with this. We tried 50 different things. We had meetings, all this stuff, nothing's happening. One day, 4 o'clock, no, not 4 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, I get a call, boom. He's in jail, you got to come pick him up. Oak Cliff. Okay, I got my blue convertible Dawn. I'm parked in Oak Cliff. You know what Oak Cliff is? Oh, sure. Like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm there, parked outside. I'm like, what a great situation. I, you know, you really want a good story? What if I get robbed right now? What a fantastic story right now in Oak Cliff. I'd love to tell that story for the rest of my life. I go inside the jail. They think I'm a, what do you call it, uh, uh, the lawyer. And then no one bothers me. They come talking to us next. Hey, that's a nice ride. That's a nice this. Thank God there was a cop on the other side, so nobody was doing anything. I'm sitting in the car for three hours waiting for him. He comes out. He's in the car. And the Rolls Royce done. Rolls Royce done. In, in, that, in that neighborhood. And he tells this story in a video he made. And he shares this with everybody. And he says, uh, he's crying, he's like feeling guilty. I'm not saying anything. And he says, hey, Pat, I have up. I said, yeah. He said, how come you have nothing to say? You normally have things to say. I said, I got nothing to tell you, buddy. He said, Pat, you need to tell me something. I know you love me. I know you care about me. Tell me something. I said, I got nothing to tell you, bro. Pat, you got to tell me something. I got nothing to tell you, guy. Nothing. I got nothing to tell you. I love you like my own son. I love you like my own family. But I got nothing to tell you. I need something from you. I said, okay, I'll give you two things. I said, you're about to ruin your life because you lack gratitude and you have no perspective. Zero perspective. You keep saying you want to be a running mate. You keep saying you want to be somebody that wants to run with me for the rest of my life. Moving forward. You cannot be in the inner circle. Why not? I can't have anybody in my life that's a core five, ten people that knows everything about the big things we're doing that drinks alcohol. Because if one day I leak something, information to you at a bar and something, you want to brag about how close you are to me, you're going to leak it to somebody else. You can't be that. So if you can't control your dangling because it's all about girls, if you can't control alcohol, if you can't control your loose lips, if you're super conceited, arrogant, cheap, entitled, you can't be in the inner circle. 
and he's crying, 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 hardcore. What do I need to do? Dude, I, there's nothing I can tell you that you need to do. What do I need to do? You know what you need to do. Okay, comes back. Every day for I think six months, he goes to AA meetings. Every day he goes to AA meetings, gets the coin. Hmm. You know who he gives the coin to as a gift three years later? Really? He gives the coin to me. Wow. It's in my office right next to my computer, and I'm proud of him. Four years now sober, happily married, beautiful kid, named after my dad, freaking awesome. I'm so happy for him. He had his biggest month ever last month, living in a beautiful home. Yeah. So, so excited about where yeah. he's at. But there's one thing he never had. He never had the arrogance, the entitlement, and being cheap. It's so unattractive to me. So at every phase, you go, certain people you give a lot of chances to. Your kids, it doesn't matter what they ever do. You have to love them. Your kids, no matter what they do, you're mm -hmm. going to love them for the rest yeah. of their lives. But yeah. th these running mate concept, every year I cut and I add. I cut one or two people that are close to me because you can't be close to me if yeah. we're going to the next level, yeah. and I add. It's a very tough exercise to do because it's process of elimination. Who's next this year? Right. And uh, this, this year's 2023s was very tough, but I had to do it. Hmm. I've been seeing you make that process and, and progress through it. But a powerful story. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, PBD. Uh, I want to ask you about an uh, 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 interview you did with Ryan DeSantis on, on the PBD podcast. Yep. yep, here we go. So um, Here we go. Now we're getting interesting. <laughs> I got Ferragamo's on, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> so it was specifically that. I mean, you know, the the clips from that podcast, it yeah. was all it's all over the internet. It's blown up. He's got heels on in his boots. Heels on his boots and and you gave him a gift. He said, I can't I can't accept, accept gifts. gifts. Yeah. You know, but he did nothing to disprove. Yeah. You know, I, I would say you're six four, I'll stand up right next to you. I mean he did nothing nothing yeah. of that. So but by the way, I think it's it's funny, but from the outsider looking in, for a guy that's wanting to be a president of the United States, is that a for me, it was, it's, it's funny, it's, it's, it's entertaining. Yeah. But is it a trivial way to look at a presidential candidate in spite of what's going on? And is he a better governor than he is a president? Valid you make question. It? Valid question. Yep. I'll cover all, all of it yep. with you. Yep. So I did the interview. The interview ends, and I go read every comment. And I read every comment. Every day I've read every comment, and I'll go to the newest. Do you know 98% of the comments, what they say about him? They loved him more after the interview. Hmm. Okay. okay. They liked him more after the interview. Why? Because to me, sometimes when my job is to ask questions, I can, I can, I was respectful. I didn't drop f bombs. Mm -hmm. I didn't say anything about your mom or your dad or your family mm -hmm. or anything. My job is yeah. to ask questions as an interviewer. You're asking me questions. You can ask me any question you want. You haven't offended me. True. How I answer it is on who? It's is you. on me. Yep. Okay. So I'm asking, I'm asking a question about the boots. What am I hoping to get? Levity. I'm hoping to get self-deprecation. I'm hoping to get make fun of yourself. I'm hoping to get here. Why don't you do this? Okay. Sure. Why don't you show it? Yeah. I'm hoping to do that. You yeah. know who did that? I tell you who did that. Donald Trump was on Jimmy Fallon's show, and he's running for office. Everybody says Donald Trump's hair. He's got a wig. That's a wig. That's a wig. And Jimmy Fallon says, "Hey, let me ask you a question, man. Everybody says you got a wig. That's like me asking a question about boots. boots. Okay. Yep. Everybody says you got a wig." Yeah. So you think I got a wig? Can I feel it? He goes like this. <laughs> and then have you ever seen this before? No. Okay. Yeah, he yeah, goes like this, yeah. like this, like he's supposed to. No, that's his hair. <laughs> Guess what? One, yeah. Trump won points. Sure. He became likable yeah. and score went up. That's actually his hair. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Show it if it is. Yeah. Do that. It's an opportunity for you to kind of be. It, 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 and by the way, so now some people will say it was a number two trending hashtag on Twitter for 48 hours. Wow. Bootgate. Is what Boot they call it. Not, <laughs> right. not Watergate, but Bootgate, right? Jimmy Kimmel covered it. Jimmy Fallon covered it. Um, uh, Tonight Show, uh, uh, what do you call it? The Late Show, Colbert, wow. uh, uh, Charlemagne the God. Yesterday was on The View. Uh, they, they played a whole clip from the podcast. Wow. It was on The View. You got MSNBC, you got Fox, you got CNN, you got podcasters, you got YouTubers, you got Megyn Kelly. I don't know if there's anybody that hasn't covered this. It was the most trending topic for 48 straight hours mm -hmm. to the point where even yesterday Nikki Haley is being asked by somebody so Nikki what do you think about you know boots are you gonna wear high heels she says well at least I know how to walk in my high heels <laughs> she joked about it then today the governor comes out and says you know these people that are talking about my boots they're, they're they have foot fetishes this is the wrong time to be thinking about this stuff you're missing the point 
My whole criticism of the governor for the last year has been your marketing team sucks and you have to use these types of opportunities. I came to your state because you were the best, best governor, governor in America. I said that to Dylan and I said it to his face so he didn't think it's flattery. Oh, he just says the stuff in front of his kids, but behind my uh, back he's going to talk shit about me. In front of his face on the show, I said, I told you yesterday when he came to the game and he came to our booth and there's 28 of us of fight, value team in, and he come and talking to everybody, which he was so respectful and so polite and so, you know, uh, uh, genuine to be around. And I told my son, Dylan, do you know who this is? No. I said, this is the governor of the state of Florida. This is the reason why we're here. This man is the reason why we came to Florida. So I said it on the podcast while at the beginning. Then at the end, I asked him the questions, what decade do you listen to? You know, 80s, 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, oh, nah. Like all the stuff we're talking <laughs> right. about. But moral of the story, my job is to ask questions. Your job is to answer. But you need to figure out a way to show levity. People love self-deprecation. Make fun of yourself a little bit. It's okay. You don't need to be uptight if you're wearing heels Talk about it. If you're not wearing heels, show it. Mm -hmm. You just be like, here's what I got. Game. Mm -hmm. And then people are going to be like, you know how quickly it goes? Kind of like this. You know what? You're fat. You're kind of right. I am. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, okay. You know what? You're fat. I'm not fat. Uh, I'm not fat. I don't. Dude, like, you have a choice on how yeah. you react to it. Sure. Okay? We're totally okay with mm. somebody having flaws. Yeah. Okay? And, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, a lot of people right now are saying that it's going to be one of the opening questions at the debate this wow. week in Miami, next week in Miami. And uh, nobody knows how he's going to come up. Uh, uh, most people are saying guaranteed one of the competitors that's not on his side, Vivek or Haley or yeah. somebody's going to bring it up. Christie yeah. won't bring it up because yeah. they're allies. But, uh, you yeah, listen, um, people are upset at me from the DeSantis camp saying, how dare you ask a question like that? Brother and everybody else that's supportive of that. You got Israel, Palestine, Hamas, you got Russia, Ukraine, China, mm -hmm. Taiwan, Azerbaijan, Turkey, mm -hmm. Armenia going on. You don't know how to answer a question about your boots. boots exactly. And you want to be the leader of the free world? I'm sorry, man. You know, you had a missed opportunity. That's not on me. That's on the way you answer the question. Whew. And the way we saw you handle AB, Antonio Brown, yeah. and I was pissed off about it, the CTE, and then the patient, extreme patience you had. Yeah. And, and I, I want to ask you that too, PB, because I've seen some deals you've done. I've seen some things uh, done behind closed doors. I've seen major spears thrown in your back, people crossing you, and, and, and people have crossed me you've, the way you've protected me in many different instances. You show extreme amount of patience. Is there a point where patience is a virtue where it actually hurts you? Because I've seen every, every time you've used it, you always use it to a depth where it's always advantage, is it, is it advantageous for the situation that we're in. In my attempt at that practice, you you do some things I would not have any patience with. I blow up. Uh, I'm like I got a lot to learn from PBD. So how how do you have patience when things aren't going your way and people do things uh, behind closed doors and, and and people have crossed you? Is is that a virtue? Is that a, is that a, a, a don't, don't ever let how I react reflect how I feel inside. Of course, I know you burn up inside. So when I'm sitting <laughs> in like, front of Antonio <laughs> Brown here, you idiot, you idiot. <laughs> It's just a parody, right? It's parody. just a parody, parody. right? You ain't, you ain't know where I'm from. I'm from Liberty. I'm from Liberty City. City. You know, I'm from, you, you, you a Persian. You a Persian. You grew up with money. I'm like, dude, you have no clue what I grew up with, but all good. No problem. I understand what he's doing, and he's going through challenging times and all this other stuff. No. I don't know. I think, um, you know, you, you can, in your mind in that moment, you play it. And I could say X, Y, Z. If I say X, Y, Z, it could go this way. If it goes this way, do I get what I want? I won't get what I want. If I don't get what I want, then was it the wise move or did I just seem like a tough guy? No, you didn't get what you want. You're an idiot is what you are if you do that. I'm telling myself, in my mind, I'm telling that. So I'm like, okay, step back, be patient. You got one more hour with AB. Hey, what do you like to do? I like to swim. Really? You're a good swimmer? Yeah. So what's this thing with the swimming? So I love to swim. Tell me about this. And then he opens up. So I'm like, hey, why'd you do, why'd you do that? I mean, it's the guy's wife. Yeah. Yeah, it's the guy's wife. This guy actually liked working with yeah, you and playing with you. So wh guess what happened? When that happened, Tom Brady responded on Instagram to one of the posts, and he liked it. And then Tom Brady accepted the offer to come to the vault. So what did patience get me? Maybe in that moment, it's like, oh, you know this, but at the end, Brady's like, mm. I actually really like the way you handled that. And we were the first one that Brady ever did an hour and a half interview with. Yeah. Brady doesn't do hour and a half interview type of stuff. And yeah. 
he came. Normally it's like yeah. 45 minutes in, out, you know, when he does. Outside when he's doing with his, you know, man in the arena. Yeah. But typically. Throwing footballs to Tico. Yeah, Dylan. throwing yeah, footballs yeah, to yeah, Tico yeah. and Dylan. And everybody's like, <laughs> oh, my God, I can't believe that happened. He's like, so, Dad, you going to run or what? You going to run around? I'm like, oh, shit, this guy's challenging me already. And I'm running around. But, no, you know, the, the, the moral of the story with that is when I haven't been, it's hurt me. When I have been, it, it hasn't helped me 80% of the time. But it's definitely hurt me more not being patient than being patient. PB, when you're thinking about business plan, we've done business plan with you every year. We've been here since 2015. We've, when you were in Dallas, we flew into Dallas. Now that you're in Florida, we're flying to, 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 to Florida to get business planning done with you. And oftentimes people think a business plan is just something that you, you put something on a piece of paper, spreadsheets, for, you know, forecast yep. projections, yep. And, and you know, SWOT analysis, and, and you know, I'm going to raise money for my business, my endeavor. What has business planning meant for you in a context? Because every time we come to a big meeting and we do business planning with you, it's very simple at the same time as well. It's not, it's not this 25-page business plan. It's a very simple, impactful statement, you know, uh, OKRs, you know, some of the, things, the, the vision you forecast for that year. Which, by the way, one of the things that we planned for last December has happened so we get to enjoy a result of one of our areas of accomplishment in, in 23 from the business plan we did with you uh, last year. So. Can you can you extrapolate you know the importance of business plan for the aspiring first generation cash flow millionaire? You know it's 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 exciting when you write a good business plan that gives you the step by step know how how to what to do sequencing, you know where it's not like you're winging it because you're just putting your top ten goals, and then at the same time it's emotional. You like you go there, you're living. The, oh my god! Like you know for me, I, I, I this one movie I talked about it constantly at the vault. Uh, uh, Meet Joe Black, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at Anthony Hopkins, 65 years old, death comes, you know, Brad Pitt, and then all of a sudden his y oldest daughter is putting a party together for him, and his youngest daughter works with him and is dating his right-hand guy who ends up betraying him, who they're about to get married, and his daughter's not happy. And this house that I see, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that house. Like, I visualize putting a party together because I want the kids to be as close to me as possible for as long as possible. I talk to the kids constantly about this I just want to I always dreamt about you know everybody living together in a house my kids could have marriage family kids mm -hmm. but I want them to be on that end and this one's on this end and the other one is on that floor and this one's on this one they all have their own kitchens and maybe we come together at night or maybe we come together on the weekend or maybe I buy four or five houses right now it's always been a dream like of your mine. neighbor in, in Beijing yeah, 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 it's yeah. always been a dream of mine right mm -hmm. so I go there I watch me Joe Black I'm like babe we got to go look at houses in, uh, in Hamptons. We got to go to Sagaponic. We got to go to Sag Harbor. So then we go. We go look at this house. It's on the market for $120 million. The father built the house for his uh, son. This, uh, the house he built for his son is 28,000 square feet. The house he's living in is 18,000 square feet. I showed you this house, what sure. it looked like. Yeah, crazy house. It took us yeah. two hours to get a tour this house. And I'm walking inside, and I'm just kind of thinking about it. And I'm selling the dream to the kids. The kids wouldn't leave the bowling alley. And then there was a full-on spa and a gym basketball court, Nets, because it's a Nets owner. And you're like, dude, awesome. Then we go look at the next house, Sagaponic, and this 23,000 square foot house. And the realtor, to realtors, let me give you guys what this guy did. Whether it's intentional or accidental, it was very effective because my immediate reaction was very innocent. We're walking around the house, and he's got a bookshelf. What is the first thing a person do that's written a book before? They go look to see what books are there. Guess whose book I found on the bookshelf? Your next five moves. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, my God, this guy's reading you. What a great owner of a house, right? And then, yeah, I don't know who it was, this man, whether he put it there or not. What a great strategy. So if you're ever selling a book to an author, always put their book in a bookshelf. Whether they read it or not, it doesn't matter. They're going to like it. So then, then we look at that house, and then he says, hey, uh, so here's where Sagaponic is the most expensive. You know the white party that the, the one guy put up? It's yeah, with all, all the, Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, that's where it's all at. The, all the so, celebs, yep. It is the most expensive real estate in America, Sagaponic. He says, if you buy this house and that property comes with it, because that was the school here years ago, but there is a two-bedroom house on the water that I want to show you. So you can buy this and you can buy that. This one is $27 million and that one is $10 million. What if you buy both? And we get down to the other house. Kids are running on the beach and you're just dreaming like, ah, oh, that's freaking sick. <laughs> I love it, right? But what, what is the moral of the story? So if a plan gets you to be childlike, childlike. Mm -hmm. I just bought a very big card today, oh. a holy grail card today. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you about okay. it afterwards. Okay. 
I'm excited about By this. By the way, card. I went to the time. I remember when you bought the Gretzky card. They were right here in the, in the yes, boardroom. Yes. And I'm holding these with these gloves. I'm yes. looking at the picture like, PB, what do you have me holding? PSA 10, Oki Chibi, and uh, uh, was it Tops? Oki Chibi and o Tops, yeah. And you buy it for 500K. They, they hand yep. delivered it here yep. to you. Yep. And then during the pandemic, you sold it for what, 2.1? 2.2, 2.17 2. million dollars. It makes, it makes Yeah. Record breaking. So, but you know, like right now, you, you and I look what we just won with these cards, right? Yeah, we became, yeah, we yeah. became 12 years old. <laughs> And we're not 12 years old, but look what just happened to it. So if a business plan can get you childlike, yeah. but it's also got a plan yeah. to back it up on going there, man, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so exciting, yeah. right, to have that happen. So, yeah, for me, the, the reason I became better at business plans is because I helped people write many bad business plans. And I needed to add more and more structure. So eventually, mm -hmm. what it was is when you, when you read this book, uh, Choose Your Enemies Wisely, the whole concept you will go through is this, this, this structure you will see on uh, what it takes to write the right kind of business plan. It's somewhere in here. There you go. I just found it. Mm -hmm. You got to go through the 12 building blocks, right? Okay. The 12 building blocks you got to go through on how to write the business plan. Vision capital, culture team, dream system, mission plan, will success, will skill, enemy competition, and then how to put it all together and how to put it on a piece of paper that you can get excited about. So, yeah, the right business plan that has the elements of competition and dream yep. and emotion uh, we'll get the best study. And by the way, December, this book is being launched December 5th. And 2023, I call 2023 the year of investigations. <laughs> I, I said this last November of 2022. I said, dude, everyone's getting investigated. It's going to be investigation left and right. So what did 2023 end up being? Uh, Trump investigation, Biden investigation, Fauci, you got Hunter Biden, you got now SBF, $8 billion. You got all these strikes that's going on now with Kaiser, with, you know, uh, you, 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 the, uh, what do you call it, auto workers. workers yeah. Then you had Kaiser, 75,000 employees, sad. CVS, Walgreens, yeah. all these guys that are doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. 20, Actors Guild, yep. But I tell you, 2024 is the year of chaos, chaos, man. There's never been a time where you have to be more prepared with planning going into a year than 2024. 2024 is going to be chaotic. You, you better be ready for yeah. it because the opportunity is going to be very big. I've been at every vault that you've ever, Jose, been honored to be there, honored to be invited. And... Uh, I know as the first two, three years, even through the pandemic, everything like, everything's great. Well, the pandemic, you couldn't do anything, but the year after, you know, flooded of the market with, with capital and, and, and stimulus money and everything's going great. This last year, uh, my observation from the, you know, just observing the entrepreneurs that go to the vault, it was a much different conversation. It's like, okay, things are tightening up. Uh, my business dropped by 60%. I mean, it's a real thing. And then Gaines and, and, and Palio and Swaz were looking at each other, wait, wait a minute, our, our business is thriving. We're, Thank God we picked the right industry and the right platform to be a part of. We're, we're surging in, in income. These guys are contracting uh, and reeling. And, and by, by the way, therein lies the opportunity to, to run towards chaos and, and, and get the right business. And I, I notice every time we do business planning with you, we always are jacked up. Uh, and, and our energy, and every time we're in, in a full-timers meeting, every time we talk about business planning and, and, and basically going to realtor.com, where do you want to live? Where do you want to live? And, and uh, people get jacked yep. up about that uh, conversation. It always lightens up and gets people back, back to being clear and being fired up again. But I can't end this uh, interview without asking you the obvious, obvious question what's going on in the world today, what's going on with Israel and Hamas and you being uh, from Iran. And so, and, and I just noticed that the, on Instagram, my, my, my most, uh, the city that has the most followers from, oddly enough for me, is from Tehran, Iran. <laughs> I'll show you my analytics right now. The city that follows me the most on Instagram is from Tehran. I don't know why. So I don't know their association. Yeah, I'll show you the analytics. But... I don't have a dog in a fight. I'm an American. I'm trying to make sense of this thing. I'm on the side of human life. I don't like seeing, on both sides, I don't like seeing, you know, just seeing the blood on babies and babies. I just, it, just, it just disrupts me as a, as a father. And so how do we wrap our mind around what's going on there? And, and how does it affect us here in America? Because we're sensing, you know, the, the knock on the door of World War III uh, uh, coming down and China's mobilizing. China in the Philippines is hitting sh ships with Philippine Navy, Navy and the Chinese Navy are knocking boys and, and America's like, hey, we're going to defend the Philippines too. And so how do we wrap our mind what's, what's going around in, in world conflicts? Today? Where were you born, Matt? I was born in Chicago, 1973. Okay. okay, so what is the most, 73, so what is the most catastrophic event that's taken place in the last 50 years that, you know, you witness where you're like, dude, no one's going to do that to the country I live in? Uh, easy, 9-11. Okay, 9-11, okay. I think you were probably also 
when when uh, the attempt assassination attempt on Reagan, right? That was sure. sure. Okay, right, so that right. was so. Would you put those eighth. two as top two? What would you put? Those are the top two. Uh, sure. Um, what else? When I was put? in the military, the the, the uh, assault on uh, the USS Cole, that was, that was pretty. That was mm -hmm. pretty significant too as well mm -hmm. for us. You know, uh, Beirut, uh, in, in Lebanon, you know, when, when in, in '85. So these are things that are ramping up. Yeah. So, but but think about it like. Uh, you know, things that matter to us as Americans, okay? Now, what matters if you talk to India, Indians who grew up in India, and then ask them about Pakistan? They're probably going to be like, well, what do you mean, right? You talk to an Armenian, then bring up Turkey. Turkey, yeah. Okay, Genocide, you talk yeah. to an Assyrian and an Armenian, you bring up Turkey. Okay. Now, it's funny, most people don't know this, is my chef is a Muslim Turk. Wow. He's, he's not only from Turkey, but he's also Muslim. Wow. And it's our chef in our house. Wow. Every day, okay? And he's incredible to our kids. Incredible to our kids. But he's a Muslim and he's Turkish. Now, you explain after the Armenians hear about that, they're like, how could you do mm. something like that? Yeah, because of the Turkish. But yeah. I totally get it. Yeah. Because I'm Armenian and a Syrian and the Turkish genocide, what they did to Armenians April 24, 1915, absolutely devastating when you hear that genocide, right? And then what Erdogan did. Okay, that's immediate to me, okay? You talk to a German who was born in Germany. What are they going to be thinking about, okay? What are they going to be super delicate and sensitive about? You talk to a Brit who is maybe 70 years old. What are they going to be delicate about? Maybe it's going to be Hitler. Maybe it's going to be different things. You talk to a Jew. Where are they automatically the going to go? To? Automatically, yeah. Holocaust. We're not going to have that happen again. Yeah. We're not going to... Yeah, you go to a, uh, um, you know, Iranian. You go to a... Uh, South Korea, what they had to do, we can go all over the place and there's going to be something that emotionally, emotionally gets more out of you yeah. than we would. Yeah, right. Like to us, we're like, dude, it's Palestine and Israel. Yeah. Why do we say that? Because you're not Palestinian and you're not Jewish, okay? You're not from Israel. So to Israel, like, we got our country back and never again and we're going to be this and we're going to be, and they're determined to never lose their land. Okay, so the profile of somebody who is Jewish they're paranoid. They're afraid of losing a small little land that they have. They're in the middle of chaos. Mm -hmm. The land mm -hmm. they got is probably in the worst possible place they could have got. So Surrounded could, by a, a, Here's yep. the land. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. Everybody <laughs> around you hates you. Go. Yeah. Okay, go make it work. Imagine you live in a community yeah. where the five houses around you, all right. of those families cannot stand you and your kids. Right. Right. Try to make it work. Okay. So, so I understand their position. I understand what, you know, there's a video I saw about grandfathers, 80-year-old, telling their kids and grandkids, you know, the, wh who Palestinians are and all these guys, and we should kill them, and we should do this, and we should do Okay, so that's being told, and you don't, and that story's being told. And you're like, listen to your grandpa, you have to buy it. It's your grandpa telling that story being passed down to you. Okay, got it. <sighs> then you have Palestinians, you're seeing the videos. Look what they did to this, and look how many people did this. And then you got Hamas, who in their charter says, their goal, their 1988 charter, is to make sure, you know, Israel is wiped off the face of the earth. Okay, that's, that, guys, that's concerning when somebody says that. Mm -hmm. But you don't understand what they went through and all this other. I totally get it. In, in politics, there's Republicans, there's Democrats. Then there's the far right, then there's the far left, okay? You got AOC here, and you got the guys that are on the far right here. Bernie, Warren, these guys, and you got whoever's on the far right, okay? So, all right, so let's just say you got Muslim, you got Christian, okay? Then you have Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, ISIS, guys here. Then this is the Muslim. Guess what? You're, if, if, if in Gaza, 58% of support of Hamas, you're telling the world you support what Hamas believes in. And if in the West Bank, you know, the, it's 42%, you're still supporting Hamas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not that easy and all this other stuff. Okay, and then Netanyahu, you mean to tell me you didn't know what was going on? You have the best secret service in the world and you don't know this? How many times in the world have Mossad, people, yeah. how many times in the world has this been used where a government needed a crisis of devastation of innocent people dying to get the rest of the population supporting in their decision to annihilate an enemy? It's happened many times. Mm. So could there be an element of that, that where 
Netanyahu wants to get out of jail card to be able to go take out the people that he wants so they can get that land to be theirs and you move them out where other people have to take the refugees and go to Egypt, but Egypt doesn't want to take them. It's like, no, 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 we got a border here, man. Yeah. You know, if America only treated their border the way Egypt did, we yeah. would be a better place. Eight yeah. million people have crossed the border. Our sure. border's not as good as Egypt's border. Exactly. Imagine saying that to an American. Yeah. Our border is weaker than Egypt's border. In the Middle East. How wild is yeah. that right. for the American to realize? So, um, but uh, uh, my, my, as a person that's from the outside, America is first for me. I'm America first because I live here. My kids live here. If you live in America, you should also be America first. Then for me goes to allies, okay, my allies. But let me tell you what kind of allies I don't like. For example, if a guy knows me and he knows I'm best friends for Rafi's place and he goes to Rafi's place in Glendale and says, yeah, I'm uh, Patrick's best friend. Can I get a table of 10? I know you guys are busy right now. Ouch. You have no idea how much I can't stand it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they call me, they're like, hey, Pat, we paid for the whole thing because he said you're this, and look, we just did it because we respect yeah. you. I said, no, bro, how yeah. much was the bill? No, we're not going to take money from you. How much was the bill? We're not going to take money from you. Now I feel like shit because you used a card of being friends with me to yeah. abuse. Yeah. To do that, yeah. So you could be an ally. Yeah. But if as an ally, you're like, well, America supports 80% of what we're doing, so we're going to go to... Don't do that, bro. Don't do that. Now, yeah. maybe that's a private conversation that's yeah. not on camera because we have to look unified. Mm -hmm. But privately, I'm going to tell Netanyahu, don't do that again. Yeah. If you do that one more time, I have to publicly announce Because we have to support you, the United States. Because we yeah. yeah. we're America first, yeah. and yeah. I don't yeah. like what you're doing. Now, yeah. the other side, some people are going to be like, well, we do have to support Israel because Israel's never once asked us to yeah. send military and all this other stuff. They have their own military. They have their own this. They have their own that. Okay, good point. So they're not asking for Ukraine send us $100 billion and every six months Zelensky's coming and saying, I need another $40 billion or else you're going to have to send your kids. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. At least Israel is not necessarily doing that. They just want to say, can America endorse us? Like, you know, for us to have that. Mm -hmm. So, um, look, I can go on and on talk about this. At the end of the day, we are not going to find out 100% what's going on there. I don't blame the people that are emotionally attached. I don't blame the people that are Jewish that are going to be fully committed to what's going on there. I don't blame people who are Muslim that are tied to what Palestinians are going through. I don't support at all what Hamas did. I don't support innocent kids dying. Uh, it, you know, some of the strategies could have been done differently. We just go hit up the tunnels that Jocko was talking about, which is, mm -hmm. you know, as a guy from that yeah. background, we should probably listen to a guy like that when he's giving a feedback. But, uh, yeah, there's not a black and white answer. This is one of those issues that's got a lot of layers yeah. of gray area that we won't know about for many years. It'll probably never be solved. Yep, so, I agree. You know, I don't, however, in addition to all this, people tearing down pictures of kids on the wall as if they're creating a state right. of virtue signal. I don't, that's right. I don't like that either. So. That's right. Uh, PBD, I mean, I appreciate you for being on the podcast. And I'm honored to have you at my birthday party tomorrow. We're going to oh, have, have a blast. I can't wait for it, man. I can't wait for it. <laughs> 70 style. You yes. know, so you I got to go for I don't have something, gotta, man. Gotta, I got to figure out what we, I'm going to we'll do. Care, my 70 style is going to be a suit <laughs> is what it's going to be tomorrow. But We'll find him some... Uh, Find like a, a you know Rick James wig or something like that. We'll figure but, uh, something out. We'll figure something. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to Valuetainment. Make sure you follow PBD. Listen to the PBD podcast, and of course on December fifth, make sure you purchase. Choose your enemies wisely. And by the way, I might have some access to some signatures from PBD. So if you're one of the first people to buy his book, and you send a screenshot and say, "Hey, I bought Patrick's book," and you're one of the first, I would say, "Rain, we should say about 10, 15 people that to respond to, uh, for, drop a comment." And we should give them a, 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 a potentially a signed copy here from PB. Of course. Yeah, of course. And we How know. about you say that because it's got to be people that finish the interview. The first 10, 15 people that finish put it, it, maybe they don't finish it. Okay. First 10, 15 people that give a word. They have okay. to put a word so they'll know. What's okay. the word? Uh, Pick a word. Uh, enemies. Uh, enemies. Okay. Enemies. Okay. You put enemies okay. in quotation. That categorizes that you watch the entire thing. And then... Uh, See, this is what B yeah. PBD and I do. We always brainstorm the best contest to have, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always willing to listen to the master. So if, make sure you drop enemies. If you did that, enemies, then we know you watched the end of this interview. So that being said, uh, PBD, again, thank you so much. Oh, man. It's an honor to have you in my life. Blessed oh, to have you in our family. The Sapala family will never be the same without the Feelings David mutual, family. Bro. Feelings and mutual. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe. Drop your comments below. You agree with us, you don't agree with us, make sure you hit like and share. And uh, make sure you let everybody know that uh, they need to choose their enemies wisely. That being said, from Dallas, Texas, I'm a money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.